This episode of the MJ Cast is brought to you by Instacart, the best personal shopping and delivery service available to our listeners in the United States and Canada. Whether you're self isolating during COVID, need some last minute groceries to finish cooking a delicious family dinner, or want to surprise a friend with a delivery, Instacart is a convenient, inexpensive, and reliable option for getting the items you need right away. Give Instacart a try by going to the mjcast.com slash Instacart and discover the magic of personal shopping. The following is a presentation from the MJ Cast, the internet's premier podcast on all things Michael Jackson. I'm a black American. I am proud of who I am. Together, we can make a change in the world. I want to see you! <laughs> I like to take sounds and put them on the microscope. There's a driving bass, you become the bass. Let the music write itself. I don't sing it if I don't mean it. <laughs> Welcome to the MJ Cast, your source of news, discussion, and interviews on the King of Pop. Hello and welcome to the MJ Cast. I'm your host, Elise Capron, signing in from Studio San Diego, and today I'm joined by Pez Jacks, a longtime fan, author, and organizer of the London based Michael Jackson convention, Kingvention, in addition to many other projects. Pez has appeared on a wide range of UK television shows to speak about Jackson's music and to comment on news around the King of Pop. He also has a significant online presence, reporting and commenting on Jackson news. As an author, Pez published his first book in 2016, titled Off the Wall, From the Beginning, Brick by Brick. Pez's newest book, and the reason he joins our show today, is The Story of History. This book takes an in-depth look at all aspects of this iconic album, from its initial inception, the creation of the cover art, the short films that accompanied it, and goes into detail about each song, breaking down the context, meaning, and legacy of each track. The book also features quite a few full-color photos, some of them never before seen, and first-hand interviews with collaborators, Jackson's marketing team, and many more. As listeners know, at the MJ Cast, we've spent much of season six celebrating the 25th anniversary of history, and we're excited to dive into Pez's perspective on this album, which I think we would all agree was one of the most important of Michael Jackson's personal and professional life. Pez, welcome to the MJ Cast. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thank you for having me. Good. Well, we're so excited. It's been a long time coming. And um, first of all, just congratulations on this beautiful book you've put out into the world, which just came out this summer. Thank you. It's absolutely gorgeous. So we're going to get into all the details around this. I'm especially interested because as most listeners know, I work in book publishing. And so it's always really exciting to talk about this part of the process. Uh, So first of all, Pez, you are dialing in from London where you live, right? Yes, that's right. And it's for once, it's actually really nice weather. So, <laughs> Oh, that sounds so good. You'd think mid-September it'd be raining. It's meant to get hotter as, as the week goes on. Oh, really? Is it usually raining by, by September? <laughs> it's usually raining by July. So, Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, right, it's July. Here's the rain. So we're, we're meant to get a, a late summer, which is going to be really nice. Oh, that sounds nice. Well, much better than the fires we've been having here in California. So yes, of course, um, that sounds absolutely lovely. If you can send some when that rain does come, send it our way. We could really (laughs) use it. But no, we're so excited. I mean, you really have been involved in the fan community for a long time and have done a lot of really exciting projects, both kind of in an official fan event capacity and really on your own. So what I'd like to do, though, is kind of go back further than that and really start at the beginning and look to your birth as a fan. Can you tell us a little bit about how you very first got into Michael Jackson's music? Oh, wow. We're going quite a way back. We're going way back. We want to know the whole picture of Pez. (laughs) So I became a fan when I was about four years old. So that's about 28 years ago. So it's been a long time. My parents bought me a copy of Bad on cassette and Dangerous on CD. I think I also got a Brian Adams vinyl, um, (laughs) Everything I Do, the Robin Hood soundtrack. So whoever thought to buy a four-year-old vinyl and a CD, I don't know, but they thought it was a great (laughs) idea. So And my mum used to play Michael in the car all the time. You know, she drives everywhere. She lives 10 minutes from the dentist and she drives. (laughs) <laughs> she would just play Michael in the car all the time. And it was just he was always around. And yet it really just kind of carried on from there. You know, my brother grew older and sort of grew out of Michael and my sister's younger. And 
she never really got into him but i just kind of carried on and it was always kind of a bit you know growing up like oh you're not over him yet um <laughs> and then you know when i sort of said to my mom do you want to come to kingvention she's like okay right i see where this is now <laughs> <laughs> i do think it comes you know i think a lot of them get worried that because michael is known to have some controversy surrounding him that they worry about us and our welfare as a result of that you know what people might say to us but you know as i've always said to my mom you know me you know i i wouldn't take on this lightly and uh, i can more than handle myself so <laughs> mm-hmm. it's uh, it works fine for me good well so tell me a little bit then about your kind of growing up fan story did you get to see michael live was there a lot of this thing that so many of us around the world are jealous of of waiting at the you know ground floor of his hotels while he was traveling through england did you get to do that whole part of it yeah so i um the first time I, I saw him in person was when he came to London after uh, the trial, when he came to London in the October of 2005. My mum had gone on holiday and I had my sister and we went to London for the day and we went shopping and we got home. And I went onto my emails and I had uh, a news alert from MJ and I and it said, Michael Jackson's in London. And I was like, you're kidding. I was just there all day. Um <laughs> Right, I need to go to London. So I wrote down a couple of addresses, um, Metropolis Studios, which is where he'd been and sort of in the car park on top of the car. And I wrote down the Dorchester Hotel. And I next day I sort of threw the history tour program into my bag, stuck a fedora on my head and off to London I went. Nothing was really happening. And there was a lot of fans outside his hotel. And we were just sort of sitting around. And I made a couple of friends and I just said, oh, you know, does anyone know which room he's in? They said, no, not really. So I was like, well, why don't we just march around the hotel chanting on the outside? <laughs> um, he might come out. There's a, a great photo of all of us sort of lined up on the street outside, chanting up at the window. No reaction. Went to the front of the hotel. Nothing. And then uh, sort of went to the left hand side in the middle of a, it's like a dual carriageway almost with an island in the middle so imagine about 800 fans clambering across this dual carriageway to this island and everybody just started chanting up at the window on the top floor this window just opens a hand passes out and just drops a note out the window Um, and it you know it's like one of those cartoon moments you could hear a pin drop and then people just screamed and ran into the middle of oncoming traffic wow (laughs) Um, to get to the other side where the note had dropped over the next hour there was a whole lot of you know he was waving and we were chanting and he was you know having a great time and that was sort of the first time I got to I mean I say see him but he was so high up but you know got to be in his presence and one of the great moments of that night is he'd sort of done it for an hour or so and then he'd gone away and we were chanting and he wasn't coming back and then somebody said oh why don't we chant DS (laughs) great idea let's all chant DS so You know, we all started chanting the chorus of DS and within a heartbeat, the window flew open and he nearly fell out the window. He was punching the air so hard, you know, just (laughs) jubilant. That's amazing. It was fantastic. Um, And honestly, it's like a drug. Seeing him that first time, I was like, I can never miss this opportunity again. Every time he came to London between 2005 and 2009, I made sure I was there and Luckily, you know, I got to meet him the year after and sort of be around him a couple of times when when he came over. Wow, fantastic. You've made a lot of people jealous just now, <laughs> um, <laughs> including me. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, no, it's great. Um, can you tell us about meeting Michael and one of those experiences and how that went? Yeah, sure. So that same trip in 2005, we'd heard a, a rumor that he was going to the theater to see Mary Poppins. Um, so a group of us sort of bundled into the back of a taxi and snuck off and went uh, outside this theatre. Michael's security turned up and they were sweeping the perimeter and police arrived on horses and we thought, oh my God, this is it. You know, we're going to meet him. And Blanket got sick and so he didn't come. Fast forward a year and uh, it was the day after the World Music Awards and uh, I arrived at the hotel quite late because we'd been up late the night before at the show one of my friends was sort of at the front of the barrier and I was calling her like, Kim, Kim. And she's like, just, just wait, I'm talking to somebody. And then uh, she sort of bustled through the crowd and said to us, we need to go now. So I was like, where are we going? She's like, don't make a scene, just leave. So <laughs> when you sort of get that message, you know that something's up. So we walked around the corner and she just pulled out this note from her pocket. Um, and it had been handwritten by Michael and it just said, MJ, Prince Edward Theatre, 2.30. We just 
threw ourselves into the back of a taxi and went back to this same theater that we was at a year before again mary poppins um <laughs> So there was sort of five, six of us, and we were like, okay, this is it. It's going to happen. We're going to meet him. Oh, my God. Somehow, news got out. Around two or 300 more people turned up, and it was, you know, press turned up, and he hadn't arrived yet, and it was chaos. Eventually, he did arrive, and uh, the car sort of pulled up. The kids are in the back, and they've opened the windows, and the paparazzi are sticking their camera lenses, you know, through the windows. So I'm sort of hitting this one guy on the back of the head, trying to knock the camera out the window, and there's a fight going on over the other side. It was just chaos. So Michael just sort of jumped out the car, was whisked inside, door was closed, and that was it. Oh, sorry, let me just correct myself. There was a moment when he was in the car, and one of the security stepped out and said, Michael wants you to chant F the press. (laughs) <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. so of course we were happy to oblige so he was sort of whisked into the theater door closed and that was it and I was just devastated because I was like you know this could have been it this could have been the moment so uh, one of his security came back out and I just went up to him and I just said listen you know if when you see Michael just please tell him that we're sorry about all of that that happened we tried to keep the press away we tried to stop them photographing the kids just pass on our apologies and so he said oh look it's all right don't worry and he put his arm around me opened the theater door and just shoved me inside So I'm thinking, okay, uh, my student loan is almost run out. Do I have enough money for a ticket? What am I going to do? Oh, my God. Uh, And I'm just panicking in the middle of this theater lobby. So he came in and he said to me, right, um, Michael's bought a couple of extra seats for some fans to see the show with him. Who are your friends? Point your friends out. Honestly, it was like Sophie's Choice. I'm sort of standing at the door going, (laughs) and people are banging on the window going, pick me. And I'm just like, no, I just could only pick my friends. So I sort of, you know, pointed out my friends and, we're brought in they made us pair up and switch off our phones and we went downstairs and the show had already started so we met Ramon Bain and Grace in the lobby mm-hmm. who were getting their popcorn we went in and we were seated in the theater and the, as I say the show had already started and we were all looking around sort of you know where's Michael where's Michael and we managed to spot him just sort of sitting three four meters away in the central row so honestly I could not tell you what happened on stage for the entire two-hour production <laughs> I just watched Michael for the whole time. So no one else sort of knew he was in the theatre except our row. Just before the interval happened, Michael just stood up in the middle of the theatre to be ushered out. Chaos just erupted because people didn't know he was there. So people are screaming, oh my God, it's Michael Jackson. <laughs> um, he thought that was hilarious and he's just sort of whisked out. So everyone's congregating around this Julie Andrews room, which he's been taken into for the interval. The door opens at one point and he's being carried in the air by two security guards straight to the toilet. So I just sort of broke free from the crowd and I tried to grab his hand. And I think, I'm sorry about this. I sort of slapped him lightly on the hand as I was trying to touch. (laughs) And I came away and I was like, oh my God, I touched him. I touched Michael Jackson. So this theatre manager is just losing his mind and says, right, everyone back in your seats. You know, this is ridiculous. Get back in your seats. We all get ushered back to our seats and uh, people are, you know, really excited. And this one old woman says above the crowd, I don't know what everyone's making a fuss about. It's only Michael Jackson. (laughs) What she didn't know is he is standing directly behind her. He tapped her on the shoulder. And I have the photo just of this moment. He tapped her on the shoulder. She turned around. She gave him her hand. He took her hand and kissed it. And no word of a lie, she passed straight out. (laughs) (laughs) I need to see that photo. <laughs> I've got the photo. She's holding his hand. I'll send it to you. Yes. You know, we thought that was great. And then, so he was sort of walking down the aisle. Everybody was seated and he was about to turn to his seat. And I just thought, Pez, it's now or never. So I've just sprung up in my seat and I've just gone, Michael. <laughs> and he came striding over. So I sort of reached out and he took my hand in in, in both of his and shook my hand. And I just said, oh my God, I love you so much. And he said, I love you too. How are you? And I just sort of looked at him for a moment and then went, how am I? (laughs) And I just carried on looking at him and he was looking at me back and laughing. And then he just went, I got to go. I got to sit down. So I just said, okay, Michael, as if it's the most normal conversation to ever have with anybody in the world. Yeah. Uh, And he went and sat down and that moment just made my life. And then, you know, when he left, I I sort of tried to reach out to him and couldn't quite reach him. But he sort of, you know, was reaching out as well. And it was it was a very brief moment. You know, I'd love to say, you know, I was the chosen one and all this sort of thing. But it wasn't. It was a very brief moment. I got to shake his hand. I got to say 
what I hoped I would have said. And um, yeah, you know, he it was very strange. It was I can only describe it as I've never been on drugs, but I can only describe it as feeling <laughs> like you're on drugs. He had a T-shirt with a picture of himself on it. <laughs> and um, I just remember sort of looking at his face, looking at the T-shirt, looking at his face and just thinking, this is not real. You know, I've looked at this guy for my entire life. And now he's standing in front of me and holding my hand with a picture of himself on his T-shirt. <laughs> Very so, meta. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, you know, it was just it was a, a moment I will never, ever forget. Wow, that is so exciting. I'm really living through you on that one. That's incredible. <laughs> Something you can hold dear forever. But also, right. you know, just, you know, such a testament, as we all know, to Michael's amazing appreciation and connection with his own fans. Um, so many celebrities would never have done anything like that to begin with. And, you know, when, whenever we would stay out that, that same trip, you know, he bought everybody pizza um, wow. one night while we were there. He bought coffees one morning he was always so good with the fans um, outside the hotel, always wanted to engage with the fans, but knew that it wasn't always possible, but he always showed willing. I've seen other celebrities before. Um, funnily enough, I ended up working at Metropolis studios where he um, recorded the hurricane Katrina song. Um, and, you know, I met many people while I was working there and they just, there'd be their fans outside and they just didn't want to engage with them. And Michael just wasn't like that. Well, that is just absolutely fantastic. Thank you for sharing that story with us. Um, I will. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful <laughs> little movie in our minds for that. Right. Uh, <laughs> and again, I will be forever jealous. <laughs> I never even got to see Michael Jackson perform. So you're many ha steps ahead of me. I have one other friend here in San Diego who is British. And she also, you guys were probably in the same circles. She was also hanging out in front of the hotels and has some stories like, like yours, not quite as good as yours, but um, <laughs> but it's so great to hear, to hear that. So thank Thank you for sharing. So let's move into your life as a book author. Before we jump into the history book, I would love to just get a brief sense about your previous book, Off the Wall, um, you know, how that came together, kind of a, just a little bit about what that book covers, and maybe kind of wh where you were as a, you know, writer and fan at that moment when you decided to publish your first book. One of the, the great things I always remember is when I was studying um, A-level English, which for anyone who, who isn't from the UK, it's sort of when you're about 17, 18. And I remember having parents evening with my teachers for A-level English. And they just said to my mum, oh, he'll never go anywhere with writing. He's just not very good. My mum just sort of said to me afterwards, you have to show them that they're wrong. And that always kind of stuck with me. You know, one day I'll show you type thing. I started doing Iconic Magazine in 2010 was really enjoying doing that and then the estate announced their off the wall repackage um, and that from from what I learned when I was working at Metropolis that had been in the works for years and it was meant to be called off the wall reloaded it was actually what they were going to release before Michael announced this is it they were working on this off the wall reloaded package so the estate obviously put out their version and I remember when I read the press release and I just sort of thought is that it you know, right. it's the same album. Oh, great. There's a documentary and a piece of chalk, you know. <laughs> I have that chalk. <laughs> <laughs> Is yours broken? Because all of mine are. My, oh, yes, mine's broken. <laughs> and so, you know, when they sort of put that out and I dropped them an email, I said, Is, you know, is there going to be anything else? You know, and they just sort of said, no, that's it. Not in that polite way. Um, <laughs> so I was like, right, OK, well, he looked amazing in that era. I'm going to do a photo book. I think everybody could could you know enjoy those images so I started looking at compiling this photo book and then I just thought it would be really shady of me to just take everyone else's images license them put them in a book and then stick my name on the cover I mean you know what have I done so I decided to sort of write these historical overviews so that it could you know complement the images so I did the whole thing in sort of about four months and that was every day I'd go off to Cafe Nero on my lunch break and write a bit and edit it and pulled it together quite quickly to come out at the same time as, as Off the Wall. And that was kind of it, really. I just sort of thought, oh, I've done a book. This is great. You know, I have that to my name. I didn't put out huge numbers. I just did it more for me and more to sort of say I've done something tangible. People seem to like it. And I was quite happy with that. That is very, very cool. And that book is still available as well online. Anyone can buy it at 1611.com, right? Yes, well, that's great. So, wow. Yeah. Four months of just constant work, I imagine. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and on that front, so as somebody who works in book publishing, I'm a literary agent. I deeply, deeply appreciate the level of dedication and commitment, like you've just mentioned, that it really does take to write a full length book. So with this book, with the story of history, what inspired you, as opposed to, say, writing a, a bunch of online articles, what inspired you to take this to a level, the level of a full blown book? I mentioned in the book at the beginning, I did this, uh, I wrote this article online during the height of everything that happened last year at the beginning of the year. I wrote an article about Michael Jackson's trial by social media, where I really wanted to just sort of explore how he was being judged by people via Facebook and Twitter. And it just, it was a kind of new phenomenon that, you know, let's condemn someone on social media and, and consider it law. So I wrote that and people seemed to like it. So I did another one, which was, uh, you know, why you should listen to Michael Jackson's music more now than ever before. And I spoke about the songs on history and uh, I spent a couple of days writing it and I published it online and went to bed, woke up the next morning and just I don't even know what happened. It just went crazy. I had my inbox was just full of uh, emails from from media and fans and I was just thinking, oh, my God, what have I done <laughs> um, in a good way? But at the same time, I'm, I'm, you know, I believe it or not, I am actually quite sort of camera shy and don't like to do that sort of thing. So uh, I'd been asked to come on a couple of different TV shows and that. And I spoke to them all at length and some were very strict on what I could say. Funnily enough, the BBC were very clear that I couldn't defend Michael online which I found ridiculous. They said, you know, we're going to play clips from, from the movie that, that came out and then we're going to have someone talking about that and then we want to bring you in. But it's not your job to say that these guys aren't telling the truth and say why. That's not what we want from you. Mm -hmm. So I just sort of said, well, if you're going to censor me, I'm not going to do it. I don't think that's fair. Then Sky News said, you can say whatever you like. I thought, great, I'll, I'll come on, on your show. So, um, you know, I, I went on the show and... I spoke about the songs on history because something that was important to me is to note that when people talk about canceling Michael, they're coming at it from a place where they're talking about Billie Jean and Thriller and Smooth Criminal and all these kind of, you know, classic songs that everybody knows. My problem is that when you cancel Michael, you're talking about everything. So you're talking about Scream and DS and Tabloid Junkie and This Time Around and those songs. Right. And I don't want that voice being taken away. So I, I made that point in the interview and I sort of came out of the interview and I was really just frustrated and thought I need to make these songs, you know, more recognized. I need to do a bit more to kind of help elevate these songs again. Uh, so I thought, oh, I know I'll write an article for the 25th anniversary of history, which is next year. You know, it gives me a year to work on it. And as I was sort of chipping away at it, it just became this monster. And I started speaking with Michael's colleagues, a lot of who I'm still in contact with, and it just grew and grew. And I sat down at one point and thought, this could be a book. It just kind of manifested itself from there and ended up as it is. Well, great. Well, I'm I'm glad you <laughs> you jumped you jumped into it. That's interesting. And so on the front of kind of the the final product, um, can you tell us a little bit about? And I'll chime in here because there's stuff I love about it that I certainly want to comment on. But can you first tell us a little bit about the structure of the book? I think there's kind of a distinctive organization to the the chapters. For example, can you speak to that? Yeah. So when I sort of sat down, I just thought, right, well, how, how am I going to put this together? So I got a, a whiteboard and I was just sort of writing ideas and thinking, how, how could this look? I've always found with Michael that we always work chronologically and it just works best. Whenever I pick up a Michael calendar, for example, I can't stand it when you've got an invincible picture followed by a dangerous one, followed <laughs> right. by a history. For me, I need to start at the beginning and work my way to the end. It just it makes sense in my head. And so I really wanted to approach the book in the same sort of way. Like, you know, where did history come from? Where did it start? And how did it get to where it got? I sort of, you know, approached the first half of the book in that way, saying this is, you know, everything that was going on in his life, which led him to write and record history. This is what happened when it went to market. And then here's an in-depth look of each of the songs on the album. You know, I sort of worked closely with Dan Beck, who is one of my favorite people in the world. He is just a wonderful, wonderful person. Um, and who has written the foreword of the book as well. Yeah, well, I, I sort of, you know, had I'd almost finished and I just, we'd been speaking a lot about the book and I just sort of sent him a Facebook message and said, oh, by the way, do you fancy doing the foreword? And he was just like, I'd be honored. And I was like, well, I'd be honored. 
so we had a little bit of back and forth of well i'd be honored no i'd be honored. <laughs> uh, and then he sort of turned it around in a day or two and it's you know made me blush a lot <laughs> <laughs> and on that front, speaking of Beck, so one of the elements I appreciate so much here is that you really do get into the marketing of the album, which right. of course, Dan Beck was really involved in that side of it. And that's some stuff that I hadn't necessarily really read much about before. Some of the big plans they had, the Hollywood sign, um, the golden ticket. I really love that stuff. And you come from the marketing world. So actually, I'd love to hear a little bit more about kind of that side of it. And maybe also what you learned, like from Dan in particular, and your relationship with him, because that element is kind of what for me is one of the unique angles of this book in particular. Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite chapter in the book is Think Big, which is the chapter about the marketing. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, I'm a marketer, I w but I work in property. That's my my okay. field. Um, I used to work in music marketing many moons ago, but now I'm based in property. So I always try to keep my toe in into, into music marketing just so that I never lose touch with it. Mm -hmm. And I've always been fascinated by the marketing around Michael because he's the biggest artist on the planet. And He's always had these unique and clever ways of, of putting things out. So I'm originally, as I mentioned before, I was working on Iconic magazine. Dan Beck had done this interview online with this website, and it was just not a nice interview. Sebastian, my partner, said, um, oh, he arranges all the interviews for me. And he said, oh, I've got you an interview with that guy, Dan Beck. And I just said, I don't want to talk to him. <laughs> um, it's like, look, you know, you might enjoy it. He might he might be a nice guy. And I was like, mm, we'll see. So we scheduled this interview and I sort of sat on my living room floor and had everything ready. And Dan answered the phone. I was just like, hi, Dan. <laughs> uh, and uh, he just sort of said, listen, I would really love the opportunity to use this interview to set the record straight. I did an interview recently and I was completely misquoted. And I'd love the opportunity to to kind of, you know, clear up some some misconceptions. And that softened my heart. And so I said, OK, so we spoke for an hour and I ended up thinking, oh, my God, this guy's amazing. I was going to New York on holiday and I said, oh, let's just, you know, pop in and see Dan before we leave. We've never actually met in person. 20 minutes, you know, we'll go, we'll see him and then we'll go for lunch. Well, we spent seven hours in Dan's office. Wow. <laughs> just talking to us about, you know, his time with Michael and everything that he remembers and how much fun he had and the challenges he faced. And so off the back of that, I invited him to Kingvention and we just sort of stayed in contact from there. And that's why when I came to do the book, I was like, if anybody knows about the marketing, it's Dan. It was just so fascinating to really get into it and see the vision for this album, because I think what the critics put out was that Michael appeared desperate. You know, everything he did with history, they sort of said, oh, you know, this is coming from a place of desperation. And when you actually look, it really wasn't. It was the team sitting down and going, we have the biggest artist in the world here. How can we make this even bigger, even more, you know, incredible, even more larger than life? And I really think um, that they achieved that. I think they did a fantastic job with it. Absolutely. If only they have, could have gotten that Hollywood sign changed. Well, yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I sort of, I saw something about it online and I messaged Dan and said, hey, Dan, do, do you know about this? And he's like, oh my God, I forgot about that. Yes. He sort of went into the whole story. But could you imagine, you know, everybody in Hollywood looking up at that, that would really be like, who's the king of Hollywood? Yeah, amazing, amazing. Well, yeah, and I think your comments about, you know, how the media and reviewers, which you sprinkled out throughout the whole book, how they were perceiving Michael leading up to the release of History. And then, of course, after the album came out as well, is really interesting. Um, and just to be continually reminded that they were truly trying to tear him down. Like you said, they just said he was on an ego trip, all these, you know, that he was being ridiculous. And then also really cutting down the album itself and the songs and completely either just not listening to them at all um, or just misinterpreting them. The Think Big chapter is one of my favorites as well. You have a whole chapter on the history teaser where you kind of address some of these issues as well in terms of what Michael was trying to accomplish and how it was seen by the media and by critics. Do you want to speak a little bit to that specifically? Yeah, I found it hilarious when Diane Sawyer said to him, you know, we'll agree to disagree when he tells her what his meaning was for the teaser. 
And I think, you know, his face that he, he pulls at her when she says that. And I, I see where he's coming from. He's sort of saying, I, as the artist, am telling you what I meant. And you're telling me, well, no, you're wrong. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's just astounding. I mean, I um, spoke to Rupert Wainwright, who directed the teaser several years ago. And that part of the interview is what ended up in the book. You know, he said, most of it was my idea. He said, Michael just said, I, I want to see soldiers. I see soldiers marching. However, he did sort of say that um, there's a great anecdote in the book about Michael saying, wouldn't it be great to have banners with King of Pop on? And uh, Rupert says, oh, I was really thinking we could just kind of leave it very vague. And Michael's like, yeah, but banners with King of Pop would be great. <laughs> and Rupert's like, yeah, you know, but mis mystery and all that sort of stuff. And Michael's like, yeah, I love mystery and 50 banners of King of Pop. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I love the sort of dynamic they had in, in sort of getting that off the ground. But the critics just didn't get it. And mm -hmm. for me, I think there was an element of it where Michael just sort of said, do you know what? You're not going to like anything I do. So I'm going to do what I like. Exactly. And I really get that impression with the teaser. Now, ultimately, I do think the teaser works better as a promotion for a greatest hits album versus new music. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a, a moment. So it really cements the success of the greatest hits. You've got this statue, you've got, you know, the helicopters, and it really sort of said, this is a, a legend right here. When you kind of put the new stuff on that, it starts to take on a different story and a different angle, which I think there was a little bit of a disconnect. But ultimately, I mean, I think it's, I, I think he looks great. I love the, the whole setup. Do you remember seeing it in the theater in the U.S.? I did not get to see it in the theater, very sadly. But of course, do yeah, I did watch it years ago when it was first coming out. But no, I didn't get to have that experience. <laughs> Boo hoo! <laughs> I think that the critics said, "Oh, you know, people were hissing in the theater." Yeah, and I, I think that's hilarious. I'd love to see people hiss. <laughs> I've never been to a cinema. I've been to a, a cinema in the U.S. and seen people whooping and shouting during the film, which was a whole other experience because right. in the U.K. that just doesn't happen. Oh, um, really? Interesting. And applauding at the end, which is just really strange. It was like, are we clapping? Okay. Oh, that's great. funny. I didn't know about that difference. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but funnily enough, nobody hissed. So, <laughs> <laughs> getting a little like Harry Potter slither in there. Yeah, a few cats. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> no, that's that's interesting. Um, but I agree with you. And, you know, I think the teaser, too, is just so interesting as a testament and kind of what you're saying, too, about the story of he wanted those banners with King of Pop, you know, him just coming out of the dangerous era, just fully separating him from the Quincy, like Holy Trinity yeah. um, of albums. And I think the media critics couldn't necessarily make that separation. They couldn't accept him just for who he was necessarily. But yeah, so diving into, I guess, the rest of the book. So we have this great opening chapters, which really set the context. Actually, the first chapter, we're actually coming out of that dangerous era, looking at what he was dealing with at the time, then getting into the teaser, the marketing. We have a great chapter on Diana Walzik and the creation of the cover, which she actually helped you on the jacket art of your own book. Is that right? I known Diana for years and we sort of chat every couple of months. We do a, a really long Skype call and just sort of chew the fat about life. When I originally thought about the book, I just sort of said, oh, I'm going to stick the album cover and that's going to be it. And then mm -hmm. I just thought, actually, that's really lazy. Come on, Pez. Um, <laughs> so I, you know, thought, oh, you know, what do I love? I love ancient Egypt. I love kind of this, this whole sandstone look and this real kind of idea of it being carved into history. So I threw a really crude mock-up together and just sort of sent it to Diana and said, oh, I'm thinking of doing this for the cover or something like this. What do you think? And she was like, that's really cool. Can I help you with it? So I was like, okay, yeah, absolutely fine. Knock yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, we sort of went back and forth on it together for a couple of weeks. You know, I'd change a little bit and send it back and she'd go, oh, let's try this. And then I'd change it and she'd change it. And we eventually got to the cover as, as it looks now. And that was a real exciting moment for me with the book and really when I felt that this could be something special because to have the original album cover creator do the book as well was just mm -hmm. fantastic. Absolutely. It's really special. And on the English edition, it has sort of a sandstone yeah. version of the history statue and the French, you also have a French edition, which has more of a marble version of the statue, right? Yeah, I wanted to do something different. Um, 
my partner is French. So, you know, French was obviously a logical choice to go next because I live with a translator. <laughs> <laughs> Always a helpful thing. <laughs> He's not a translator, but, you know, it helped. So, yeah, I just thought, you know, it's always cool when you get something different. When you go, I know like when I go to other countries and I find Michael books in the bookshop and they have a different cover. I'm like, right, well, I need that as well then. Um, <laughs> so I sort of thought oh, it'd be nice to, to have that as well. So that's, yeah, that ended up as a marble cover. Cool. And are you hoping to have this translated into other languages as well? I'd love it to. I mean, it's it's been really popular in China, which has been wonderful. The Chinese fan community have been just amazing in supporting it. But there's a interest to do translations in Spanish and German. Uh, so I was thinking, OK, well, what could the cover look like now? I'm running out mm-hmm. of options. Uh, <laughs> so maybe gold or something would be quite cool. But, um, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, I'd love to have it in different languages. Yeah, very cool. Um, And so the rest of the book, we have those kind of introductory chapters. And the rest of the book really chapter by chapter focuses on each track. And what I love about the structure of the book is that I feel like it works as a really nice reference piece as well because each chapter is I mean it all it works in a wider narrative throughout the whole book but each chapter is very specific especially when we get to the songs and each chapter is broken down into giving us the real context of the times that each song was written in the actual birth of that song itself lyrically and musically the single release we get sections on if there was a short film we get a little section on that also if if it was performed live and we get a little last section on the lasting legacy of each song. Um, What inspired for you like this specific structure? And also, I guess, um, uh, you know, there are certainly plenty of Michael Jackson books out there. What was it about kind of the way you formatted, structured this book that you feel is contributing to the Michael Jackson discourse and recorded history in a way that doesn't exist yet? What are you adding to the conversation with this book? That's a really good um, a good point. You know, when I was working on the book, I, I always thought about, well, what am I adding to this? Joe Vogel did an incredible job with Man in the Music, sort of really bringing all the songs together in one book. And then he did the, the offshoot with the book about Earth song. When I first sat down, I sort of looked at Joe's work and thought, OK, I can't just do a version of that. That just seems, you know, that's been done. So I tried to approach it in a way that, well, how, let's look at this logically. So obviously you've got the creation. How was the song created? You know, where did it come from? As you mentioned, it, where was it birthed? And then after it came out, a lot of times, you know, people will say, oh, it came out and it charted and that was the end of it. Mm-hmm. And I really wanted to get into the to the nitty gritty just to kind of build on the picture of how successful history was. There's often a belief that if it isn't successful in the US and it isn't successful in the UK, then it was a flop. Well, why is that the case? You know, it was successful in Poland. Michael had, I think, two or three singles off the album went to number one in Poland. That's fantastic. He doesn't speak Polish. The album isn't in Polish, but he hit number one there, which just shows to the the level of his worldwide coverage so i really wanted to highlight that through sort of breaking down the single releases and where the videos were filmed and just really looking at what i'd already um done from interviews and what people had said and thought there's just so much information that i feel will be lost otherwise even you know with well how did the short film perform i really dug around to find where they charted Um, Mm -hmm. and then just sat there flicking through like MTV charts from 1995 each week and going, okay, it's still in the charts. It's still in the charts. Okay, it's dropped. Just trying to build it all together. And then obviously finishing with the legacy. I think that for me was a really important part to do, to sort of say, well, 25 years on, where are these songs? And as an album, I think history is more important today probably than it was when it came out. I totally agree, yeah. For so many reasons, um, especially songs like They Don't Care About Us, which, you know, I finished that chapter by saying the saddest part about that is that Michael doesn't have the chance to see what They Don't Care About Us has become. Right. And I wish, you know, with everything in me that he was here to see that. it's This has become a voice for people. You see people at protest chanting that song. That's what it was intended to be. That was where his heart was with that song. And that's why it's so important today. And you listen to songs like Earth Song, and we're talking about climate change. And Earth Song is now more relevant than it was 25 years ago. 
Mm-hmm. And it was such a forward thinking album that I think the legacy parts of each chapter was a challenge with some, don't get me wrong, you know, things like come together. I'm thinking, well, what's the legacy of this? <laughs> <laughs> because I, I love come together, but it, it's not sort of broken out on its own. Right. Well, in that particular chapter, I love how you really get across just exactly how much that song bounced around before it finally <laughs> found its home on history and an and, and uncertain home, but one that, you know, I'm glad it's there. <laughs> it's still one of those ones that people don't know why it was there. Yeah. <laughs> Rob Hoffman said to me, I just came in one day and they were like, we're doing Come Together. And everybody was like, but we've finished other songs. Why are we? <laughs> I just said, Michael, Michael wants to pull it up. Mm-hmm. So I tried to go into a bit of the background about where that song came from and the relationship to the original being derived from Chuck Berry's song. And then that got me sort of going down the rabbit hole of looking about black musicians having their music taken by white artists. And then to sort of have Michael do it brings it back full circle. It's almost that reclaiming of their own their own work. And I thought that was fascinating and a great sort of angle to put on on Come Together. Okay, let's take a quick break to chat about our newest sponsor here at the MJ cast, Instacart. If you're like me, you've probably spent a good part of the last five months staying at home with family. With COVID still affecting all of our lives, there are times when it's difficult or stressful to get to the store. Or even if you're not worried about leaving the house, I know that we've all been in that position where we're in the middle of cooking a meal or visiting with family and realize we forgot to buy something. Either way, shopping for groceries is more important than ever these days. With Instacart, shopping has never been easier. It makes personal shopping simple, affordable, and convenient. In most major cities in the U.S. and Canada, you can pick from a wide range of retailers. Do your shopping directly on the Instacart website or app to be sure you get exactly what you want. And once your shopping list is finalized, your Instacart personal shopper jumps into action. If the shopper has questions about your item preferences, you'll get live messages directly on the website and or by text message. You can keep track of your shopper's progress and have your items delivered in as fast as two hours. Plus, Instacart will deliver items beyond groceries. They can also shop for household essentials, office supplies, even alcohol if you really are longing for that COVID era cocktail. When all of your items have been shopped and your driver is on their way, you can select contactless delivery for maximum safety and your groceries will be left at your doorstep. With Instacart, in just a few easy steps, you'll have all your home shopping available at the click of a button. Now, Jamin's in Australia and he has not had the chance to try Instacart, but I've used it quite a bit and I love it. I also find that for friends who are at risk, who are older, or maybe just have a situation where they can't get to the store during these particular strange times, that it has been a really and truly a game changer. I also know for busy parents or anyone who's just trying to juggle a lot, it can be incredibly helpful. First time Instacart shoppers can also help support the MJ cast. Use our special link at the MJCast dot com slash Instacart. Remember that this service is available to U.S. and Canada residents only, and you'll want to be sure that Instacart is available in your city. Thanks so much for your sponsorship, Instacart. Okay, so diving back in, Pez, it's been so much fun to hear about some of these stories you pull out. And again, you know, just like you said, kind of diving really into the details of each track and looking at the international scope, as you mentioned, which I think is very special about this book, and really taking into consideration the whole world's reaction and not being limited to just the US and UK is so important. And I love that. And looking at the lasting legacy. So to, you know, kind of talk about your personal engagement with your book. What, I mean, what's your like very, very favorite personal story or piece of information that wasn't already out in the fan community? Is there a particular favorite like discovery you made during the research of this book? Oh, good question. I learned so much from doing it. You know, there were so many things that just sort of came up and I was like, really? Wow. I've touched on a story in the book about the uh, the angel wings in You Are Not Alone, which mm-hmm. I don't believe had been shared before. Just the whole story about that sort of that Michael just went off and did it. He just kind of said, I'm adding this extra piece to the short film and nobody knew he was going to do it. And then he came back with these wings in the video and all the guys at Sony just sort of said, what's that 
<laughs> when did you do this? When was this? You know, the the plan was that they'd done the big budget video with Scream, and then they were just going to go and do a nice one of him on stage and a bit with Lisa Marie and this sort of thing. And then Michael came back with these angel wings, and so Dan said to me, "I just kind of thought, I understand his heart, but the press are going to destroy him for this." Mm. Yeah, at the time, Michael was really dealing with this image crisis for things that had happened before, but also that. People felt with the teaser and with, you know, what came with Earth Song at the Brit Awards that he saw himself as this sort of god almost. And that really wasn't true. And so Dan sort of said, you know, by him pulling angel wings on himself, it's just adding to that it's fuel to the fire, basically. Right. So he phoned Michael and said, what should we do? And Michael was like, I love it. It's art and it's staying in. <laughs> So Dan said, you know, I always said to Michael, if I can give you market research, will that change your opinion? And Michael always was open to market research. And it should be noted, I don't think I touched on it in the book, but Dan said we would give Michael market research that was just sometimes horrific. You know, things people would say about him. We'd go and interview people in, in you know, Harlem and in Queens and places where maybe he's not as popular and the feedback they would give about him and then he would want it all and he would read it and he would go away and he would uh, you know absorb it which I think is a great testament to Michael being really in touch with reality and understanding how he's being perceived Michael said yes okay fine you know if you can bring me market research then then fine they called sort of 30 of the interns around Sony to one of the head director guys offices to watch the short film and they brought in uh, Linda Yuri Greenberg who's the head of market research and they watched the film and she said afterwards okay so what did you think and they was all like you know we loved it it was great and they asked a series of questions which they answered and then she said oh and what do you think about the angel wings and they all said we love it it's amazing <laughs> <laughs> and so dad was like no that's not the answer so Linda sort of said to Dan should we step outside for a moment she said they're lying they're all lying and Dan was like, well, how do you figure that? She was like, well, you've just called 30 interns to the office of one of the most senior people in the business to talk about the biggest artist that we have on our roster. They're terrified. They'll say <laughs> whatever you want them to say. She was like, don't worry, I've got it. So they went back in and they watched the film again. And she said, so, you know, you've all said you really like the angel wings and that's great. You know, we love them too. What do you think your friends would think of the wings? And they all just said, oh, friends would hate it. It's horrible. You know, they'd think, oh, this is ridiculous. And that was kind of the feedback they needed. So they gave that feedback to Michael and he just sort of said, OK, take the wings out. But they'd agreed to put them on the special edition of the DVD, uh, volume two, I think it was. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he, he accepted that. He accepted that the feedback was that people probably wouldn't perceive it well and it, it did go on the dvd so it was sort of win-win it should be noted that all of this happened an hour before you were not alone premiered around the world oh my gosh. <laughs> and uh, mtv were losing their mind because they have to vet the video before they put it on air mm -hmm. and they hadn't seen it and so it was an hour till it was due to go out live to the world and no one had seen it <laughs> wow uh, so they sort of chucked a, a, an intern into the back of a taxi with a vhs all the way over to mtv to sort of program it up and get it ready to go that story just kind of came i was talking with dan about they don't care about us and that story just sort of came oh i remember this happened you know casually and i was like this is amazing why didn't you tell me this let me write it down so yeah i love that story because i just think it's um it just gives you an idea of how everything was operating at that time and just how involved michael was and michael's vision and the sort of bigger picture about caring about how he was perceived and how it all just sort of worked in tandem together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I have to ask just from total fan level, what is your favorite track on history disc two? And also which of, uh, which is your favorite short film from that disc? Oh, you went there, didn't you? <laughs> I went there. <laughs> you went there. Um, oh, good choice. So my favorite song on history is Tabloid Junkie. Um, okay. It always has been. I managed to weave it into my uh, GCSE drama performance. I did uh, drama for, for GCSE and I managed to weave Tabloid Junkie in there. Oh, wow. Uh, cool. And I've just always loved that song. I think mm -hmm. it's it's my what I call my onion song. So you just keep peeling it and there's just mm -hmm. layers. Right. Uh, I love that. Thankfully, Tevo Jackie doesn't make me cry like an onion. Um, <laughs> and I've yet to try listening to it with a spoon in my mouth. But, <laughs> you know, I just think it's fascinating. And there's so many layers. And 
Tabloid Junkie is the closest Michael got to replicating the knowledge, which was the Janet song that he was fascinated with. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's he's kind of, you know, closest to that. So I love Tabloid Junkie. Um, in terms of short film, hmm, that's really tricky because... There are some good ones. And they all bring so much to the table in their own right. Yeah. It's between They Don't Care About Us and Stranger in Moscow for me. Mm-hmm. I, okay, I'll go with Stranger in Moscow. And the reason I'll say that is because I think it's, it's art. You know, you could freeze frame Stranger in Moscow at any point and it's like a photograph. Mm-hmm. And it's everything stripped back and it's Michael just there in, in the street wandering along that street as it was set up to be could be anywhere in the world and you could be that person and i think when you watch the video it's so relatable to to everybody's life we can all look at that video and see parts of ourselves in it or or experiences that we've had it's an incredible piece of work bearing in mind the fact that he wasn't even on that street just makes it even better (laughs) yeah exactly well you do a great job in the book in that in that section of actually talking about the the filming and the creation of that video is quite fascinating just the great links they went the cameras they had to use to get that kind of slow motion quality um is pretty incredible right and the the street where it was filmed i um i had a couple of photos um i asked the guys i said oh you know where did you film it oh we don't remember so i had a couple of photos from the set and i managed to pick apart a couple of sort of signs in the background half a half a sign I thought what could that be so I started you know googling these random letters from this sign and I managed to find the street on google maps turns out when I was in LA two years ago I'd parked on the street opposite and not even realized (laughs) it's just around the corner from the theater where they filmed thriller so at the palace theater so I was really annoyed that I'd parked on the opposite street I missed it but um, yeah when you Google map it, you can see everything's still the same. It's still mm-hmm. the same street. And it's, um, you know, I love finding out things like that and thinking, right, that's on the bucket list for next time I go back. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Very cool. Um, so what were some of the challenges you faced with this book that maybe you haven't faced in your extensive work and projects in the Michael Jackson fan community? I think... One of the challenges I really found was, uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier, to bring something new to the table. Yeah. Um, I really just didn't want to regurgitate what had already been said. So finding new information and, and digging around took a lot of work, a lot of research. And, you know, last year I started the book last year, which was a great time for a distraction because of everything else that was going on. And I had a few issues in my personal life, which just sort of made me really want to focus on doing anything else than what was going on. So there was sort of overcoming that personal challenge whilst trying to make a book but I think what I found challenging is trying to come at certain things from from a place where I may not necessarily have that experience to know how it was so when you look at the chapter like they don't care about us dealing with the uh, controversy over the anti-semitism sorry I should say perceived anti-semitism within that that section I had to look at this logically and think I don't want to say this is how it should have been and this this was wrong and I don't want to say well this was right and he didn't mean it and you know I understood what Michael was saying but I understood why people could be upset as well sure and so it's it's sort of saying well how do I write this in a way that doesn't upset anybody and understanding both sides and also I'm not Jewish that song didn't affect me at the time it came out so I don't want to be insensitive to anybody else it, it, you know it's the same when looking at other other situations where Michael really talks about his life experiences and the way that people treat him, I haven't experienced that. So how do I write this in a way that isn't me trying to decide that's what happened without it at knowing it happened? Mm-hmm. So that was one of the, the biggest challenges. And a couple of times I sort of phoned Dan Beck and was like, I can't do this. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the life of an author. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and throw a bit of a tantrum. Um, and a couple of times I, I did just sort of put the book down for a couple of days, um, especially when it was coming to looking at the reviews um, of the album and just really writing with a heavy heart, you know, just thinking this poor guy really just tried every time he tried to do something, they were like, nope not happening right and you almost as a fan sometimes you take on that burden because it becomes your burden and people challenge you on it which we all know from from 
especially with the last year, that suddenly this situation becomes our burden and we have to be the voice. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I found that I found that really challenging, just sort of sometimes having to to feel a fraction of what Michael may have felt reading these reviews and, and trying to get his album out to the world. I think you do do a great job of that. It's a it's a sensitive approach to some of these Um, more delicate topics, like you said, with the perceived anti-Semitism. I think you really did accomplish what you set out to do there, because in that particular section, you you make it very easy to absorb truly why, what every group was trying to, you know, accomplish and why they were hurt, but also how Michael tried to correct it immediately um, and how that must have felt. I mean, I really did feel just kind of that desperate, like, sadness of you know he tried to to, he was never trying to do anything bad in the first place he was trying to bring people together and he tried to also fix it and make everyone happy and even that you know it just continued to kind of everyone continued to rail against him so um no i think you really captured that very very well yeah i think there's it's always important that when we're writing about michael to consider this this level of cultural sensitivity and you know it, it's the worst thing to do sometimes to say to someone tell me about your experience you know they're like i shouldn't have to explain my experience to you right. but i did you know especially with with parts of um tabloid junkie and parts of they don't care i sent them to to friends in the us in the uk you know and various other places where I, i've got friends and just said how do you perceive this? You know, I sent them a paragraph and said, how do you perceive this? Does this sound right to you? Am I using the right context? Do you think, am I using the right language? Do you think people might be offended by this? Because I just, my worst fear was to just sort of put this book out and somebody to say, I'm offended. You know, and I know that happens a lot with with things, but Mm -hmm. I didn't want that to be the takeaway point from the book. So it was really important to me to to kind of get the, the cultural sensitivity right as well. Absolutely. So I have one last question about the kind of structure and format of the book. And that is to touch on these incredible full color photos you have in the book. You have quite a few of them. They're scattered all through the book in front of every chapter. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got some of these photos? Did you have to go through the whole licensing thing, which I know can be a real headache um, in the book publishing sphere? Uh, Let us know about where some of these images came from. So when I was first working on the book, um, as I mentioned before, you know, I just sort of thought I'm going to write this and stick the album cover on the front and Bob's your uncle. There we go. And then I was kind of thinking, well, should it be A4? Yes, it should be an A4 book. And then I was thinking, okay, no, but then people are not going to carry this big book in their bag on the train and pull it out and they're just not going to read it. It needs to be so that you can read it. So as I was putting it together and telling these great stories and thinking, but they need pictures, you know, we as Michael fans love a good picture. So wouldn't it be great to have some? And I've known Stephen Wissett for years. And, uh, you know, you guys have known Stephen Wissett. It was a great episode uh, that you recorded with him. And so I gave him a call and just said, hey, you know, what have you got? Have you got anything in your archive that I could license? And he said, you've seen the archive. And I was like, yeah, I've seen the archive, but I meant the archive. Mm -hmm. So he was like, oh, okay, you went unreleased, fine. So we went through and I picked out a series of images that I thought would be really nice, especially the ones from childhood. There was one image from childhood that I think was a Polaroid. It's a black and white photo of Michael, a headshot, and it was a Polaroid. And Stephen said to me, I have hundreds of images and you have to pick the one that's a Polaroid, which is probably the hardest (laughs) one for us to reproduce. I was like, yeah, but that's the coolest one. So, um, yeah. And then at the end of that chapter, I had a picture of Michael as a child in the same pose. So I wanted to sort of have the two in that chapter. But yeah, I, I sort of went out and licensed all the images, which is sometimes a challenge, you know, to, to find the right image on the right site and then negotiate the right price. And then there's always that fear that, you know, it's going to be scanned and put online, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which, sure. which happens, you know, happens to us all. But I've included some more pictures um in the french edition a great shot now of all the kids from childhood sat on the tree stump that michael was sat on um Mm, in a group and another photo of michael next to him a couple of photos from scream that haven't been seen before but yeah i just think you know i I think it brings everything to life to just have a visual for example when you're talking about um the golden ticket story in the marketing chapter to have a picture of the ticket just kind of helps you visualize it more and see what it was that you would have found in your album. Yeah, I just I thought it added a nice touch to have those images. 
Oh, absolutely. It's really special to see this stuff. And now you're going to have to do a new English edition that has all the extra <laughs> photos you put in the French edition, because now I'm jealous. I know. I Someone said to me the other day. So, um, you know, when you go to, to reprint with the English edition, there's a couple of little tweaks that I need to make before it does to sort of restock it. Will you add those photos in? That's like... I really want to, but I can imagine that people will be frustrated if they've got the the first sort of version mm. without it and think, oh, but right. I want the extra pictures. So, um, <laughs> may, you know, maybe I will. Maybe we'll see. Well, you have to do a, a you know, updated, revised, expanded edition later on. Um, yes. <laughs> people will buy, will be happy to buy both, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I should just mention, you know, part of the agreement with those images and especially the ones that are unseen means that, the book can't be made available digitally, um, mm. which was something I'd kind of decided at the beginning that I didn't want to do even before the images were included. Not because, you know, I have anything against digital books. I just felt I'm more old school. I love a, a book that you can hold in your hand and bend the cover back and, you know, flick through the pages and take it on the train with you. It's not the same. Someone bought me a Kindle for Christmas once and I was like, yay, thanks. Right. Okay. Uh, which I, I did use, but, you know, I was sort of, mm, it's not really me. Uh, so I'd, I'd always kind of intended for it to be a physical product. And then when I added the images in, obviously they don't have a digital license. But at the same time, I thought, well, if I take the images out, that takes away from, from the story. The book isn't complete then. So maybe we'll look at that in the future. Maybe I'll sort of, you know, revise that and, and try and do it digitally. But at the moment, I just want to stick with, with having a physical copy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and it's absolutely beautiful. And I do think that having these photos in hard copy like this certainly does them justice. I don't think it's ever quite the same as just seeing something on a yeah. computer screen or a Kindle. So no, I think you made the right choice there for sure. You know, again, let me just say this is a beautiful book. You really have put your heart and soul into this. I think it is a wonderful item for any fans library and collection can you tell us where readers can buy this and also um you know your other book and um you know anything else you're you're doing in terms of purchasing where can they go online to find it um so the best place to get it is 1611.com which is named after the date that i met michael at mary poppins it was the 16th oh. of november so that's where that comes from i was going to ask you that <laughs> yeah no that's um it was the 16th of november and as i mentioned before you know it changed my life and i thought well i'm going to name my company that so i did that's cool i love that so it's on 1611.com and it's on amazon in some countries i'm still trying to work with people to get that figured out on how you properly have it on amazon they do a lot of things where they're like oh you know if you do this you can do that and have this and, and i'm just so confused that i'm like oh it's on 1611 that'll do <laughs> <laughs> yeah amazon's a great mystery uh, believe yeah. me <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, that's fantastic. And um, yes, please go out and buy the book. Now, moving on to the many other things that you, Pez, do in the Michael Jackson fan world, um, you are quite involved with a number of key Michael Jackson related projects. I mean, what I would like to do is just really clarify, actually, all the things you're doing. So, so many. There's MJ Vibe, there's King Vincent, there's King of Shop, there's 1611. How does this whole enterprise work? Do you run everything? Is it a group? I mean, just give us a sense of the whole scope of what you're doing these days. I do it alongside my day job. So I do have a day job. And then I sort of come home and we do it in the evening. So it's me and, and my partner, Sebastian, and we just sort of run all of this so we have mj vibe as you mentioned which is the fan club king of shop which is is the shop iconic magazine which is sort of on a hiatus at the moment so i can have a break and then yeah convention as well sort of once once a year although thankfully not this year i've had the chance again to have a break and, and do the book one thing stems from the other and it just kind of i'll wake up and go oh i've got a new idea and sebastian's like of course you have <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and then we just sort of sit down and talk about it and and it just happens but yeah i mean it's pretty much just the two of us chipping away you know uh, we have some some other fans and friends that are amazing and help out with different parts but the core of it is just, yeah it's just us two now is sebastian as big a fan as you are or does he do, do this out of the goodness of his heart <laughs> oh no no like we we met at a michael event so oh, okay uh, okay yeah. we met sort of 10 years ago at a at an mj event and yeah, the rest is history. 
Oh, good. Well, you're lucky to have a partner in your fandom because I think <laughs> a lot of us, as <laughs> like content creators and lifelong fans, we have a very special place for our, you know, partners and spouses <laughs> who put up with it. So. <laughs> It's nice that you have someone who appreciates it um, <laughs> and who works on it with you. I think that's great. Yes, exactly. And, you know, speaking to kind of everything you're doing and the fact that you also have a day job, I would like to just take one moment to appreciate your work and also the work of all fan content creators out there. You know, you've published a book. Yes, you're charging money for it. Do you get people asking like, are you profiting off of Michael Jackson's <laughs> legacy, like giving you a hard time? I, we certainly experienced that. How does that go for you? Oh, Elise, honestly, yes, all the time. Sometimes from a very kind of snide tweet to uh, some really, really horrible emails I've had in the past about, you know, this idea of profiting off of Michael and his legacy. And that's, you know, it's a really harsh criticism to take when you put so much of your heart and your you know, passion into what you do to have people just dismiss it as, oh, you know, you're profiting. One of the things that I came to realize doing all of this sort of stuff is, let's say this. So if, if for example, all the things I did was my day job and I was to be paid an hourly rate, which is what I'm worth, you know, whatever that is, based on the money we get in return, it wouldn't even cover my salary. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So, you know, like yes. the, the, the amount of, of time we put into this, the amount of hours I put into the book, if I was to charge an hourly rate back to the company, well, you know, the company would be bankrupt because I put <laughs> so much time into write, you know, nine months writing right. day in, day out that it just wouldn't equate. And it's the same with all the other projects we do. You know, you guys must know the same with the MJ cast. Mm -hmm. You put in endless amounts of time editing and recording and emailing and arranging that if you were to be paid, it wouldn't even equate to the amount of work that you do for the podcast. Absolutely. And I think sometimes people don't understand the amount of work that goes into something. They just see the end result. Somebody said to me on Twitter the other day, oh, I assume you're doing this book for charity. <laughs> and I just sort of was like, well, no, I'm not. And actually, I have chosen not to take any profit from this book if there is any to be made. I decided that I wanted to include images, so I paid for the image licensing myself. So any money that I would have made, I've paid for image licensing, and I will reinvest in all the other projects we do to make them even better. So mm. no, I mean, I've never ever taken profit from this sort of stuff, and that's not why I do it either. I think it's, you know, I, I once said to somebody the other day that if I wanted to profit, I wouldn't have chosen Michael, because <laughs> our fan community is so... Um, there's so many different denominations within the fan community that anything you do will only appeal to a certain margin anyway. Right. So, you know, you're never going to appeal to all the fans on mass because people have different opinions and different views. And that's, that's fine. You know, that's what makes a family. But no, if I was doing this to profit, I would go after one of those like teeny buffer groups that, everybody just loves everything with their face on. And I just slap out as many projects with their face on as I could. Right, right. <laughs> um, you know, if I was going to do that, that would be, that would be my angle. But yeah, yeah. No. Um, <laughs> I think, I think it's just, you know, as I say, there's a, there's a big misconception with all content creators in the fan community that they do it for some sort of profit and they don't. I think it's really important that fans continue to uphold and represent his legacy where some of the official channels don't. Yeah, and I think if we can all kind of, you know, join together and appreciate what every different fan group and content creator is contributing, we would just be a much healthier fan community as well. Because I do think we're all putting our heart and unpaid time into it. And, and we all have something to, to add to that bigger conversation. So yeah, I think having a little respect and not going after each other for making <laughs> money off of Michael Jackson. Oh my goodness. I mean, working in book publishing, I, I do. I get people asking me all the time like about the market for Michael Jackson books. And there really is, with trade publishers, with commercial publishers, there really is not, sadly, at least at this moment. I hope there will be some years from now. There have been a few 
few breakout books like Joe Vogel, which was traditionally published, like the wonderful All the Songs book. But there really just have not been that many. And a lot of people have had to go and create their own publishing companies like you have. And with a book like this, that is completely every page full color. I know how expensive and the licensing of images, I know how expensive it is to put this kind of thing together. So just to even make your money back that you've invested in it um, is quite a feat. I'm sure you're not charging as much as you should be for this book so. yeah we kind of like we did the maths originally and then when I got the test print back and I made so many edits we added an extra 40 pages to the book oh, wow. um, and so my printer sort of said you know the price is going to go up right and I was like oh yes I'm aware now so <laughs> I was like it's fine it's already on sale I don't care you know and, and truly I don't do it for that that's I'm so passionate about Michael that I do it because I believe like my nephew and niece are, are five and three and they've been born into a world without Michael in it. Mm -hmm. I want them to be able to pick up my book in 10 years time when they're old enough to, to appreciate it, listen to the history album, read the context of it and understand why their uncle is so invested in this person, mm -hmm. you know, and, and appreciate him in the way I do. But obviously I had the advantage of, of knowing him in life. So I want them to really see that. And so I will keep doing projects like that so that Michael's legacy can be celebrated. That's wonderful. Well, we thank you for that. In terms of other work that you do for Michael's legacy and to celebrate him, you know, MJ Vibe has been an incredibly important part of the film world. Um, it's always just super, super up to date with news. It's a valuable resource, I know, for all fans and for us at the podcast when we're gathering news. So thank you also for that. And I did want to talk to you about um, the news reporting front and also elements of what you do like King of Shop, for example. So with King of Shop, you seem to be selling official Michael Jackson products. Is that yes. correct? And then how does that work with the estate. I would love to hear a little bit about that dynamic. To give a bit of history on it, King of Shop basically came about when we started Iconic Magazine. One of my friends was walking through North London and passed a wholesaler, a handbag wholesaler. And she said, oh, they've got these uh, Michael handbags in the window. We should get some. Like we could advertise them in the magazine and, and fans might like them. So it's like, OK, well, we'll go down and see them. On reflection, they were pretty ghastly. Uh, <laughs> so we went to this wholesale and we picked up these handbags. We're like, okay, cool. You know, let's see if people like them. We took them to an event in Germany. And within the first, I want to say, three minutes of the doors opening, these handbags just like, if you've ever had a hundred German women running at you to grab something, <laughs> it was terrible. I hid under the table and let the other guys just, just sat on the table. And we just sold these handbags they, just like crazy. A couple of weeks went by and I received a cease and desist from Bravado, who were the official mm -hmm. license company at the time. They thought we'd made these handbags. I was like, give me some credit. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they sent us a cease and desist and just said, you know, you can't do this. I uh, reached out to them and I just said, look, I just want to apologize that this was never our intention. Didn't really think about it, to be honest with you. Like, you know, didn't really think about the repercussions of it or, you know, how that could come across. And uh, the lady said to me, oh, well, actually, it's it's great that uh, you've called. I've got a proposition for you. Do you want to come to our offices next week? So I was like, OK, cool. So I was like, where's my suit? <laughs> so I sort of went down to Bravado where they're all in jeans and trainers and I'm sat there in a suit. So uh, Seb, <laughs> Seb and I went down and uh, this was 2011 now. And she said, obviously, you know, we produced all the merchandise for This Is It and what happened happened. And we've now got rooms full of it and we're doing buy one get one freeze on the website and we just can't shift it do you want it you have to buy it obviously but you know do you want to take it off our hands we'll do you a, a price and are you interested mm -hmm. so i was like yes of course i'm interested so we did a deal and you know we sort of paid them off over time and we acquired all the leftover this is it stock oh, interesting. Um, wow. so we went to to the middle of leicester in this tiny little car that we'd hired because we don't own a car they just came out the warehouses with pallets of stuff. And I was like, this is not going to fit in the car. We got it all in and we, we got it home. And then they sent another shipment over to our house. And we just laid it all out on the floor. And was just like, well, what do we do with all of this now? We don't have a website. We don't have any idea. We just got all this stuff. You know, I sort of said, oh, well, you know, let's come up with a name. And we toyed with a few things. And King of Shop sort of seemed like a play on King of Pop. And yeah, we set up a website. We held a, a launch event. Um, with all this this merchandise and stuff 
and it just kind of grew from there really and so from the back of that you know we worked with bravado on some new designs so that i went to them and said oh you know can we pick something new so the way it would work is that bravado would submit a design to the estate for approval if the estate approved it it would come back and they could produce it so they said to me okay well these are the designs that we have from artists what do you like so i said oh you know i like these ones and sent it off and some of them got approved and we produced those products some of them didn't now the challenge is that the estate would never give a reason as to why they didn't approve it Hmm. So they would never say, oh, it's the color, you know, it's the logo, it's the shape, it's the font. They just would say no. So it's really hard when you're trying to get to a yes. You know, usually you go through a process of elimination. Okay, well, is it the color? We'll change the color. But the estate being the estate just said no. So uh, there's a lot of things that were amazing that just never came out. Hmm. Um, And then Bravado sort of lost their contract and the estate chose to go with ABG. So we just found sort of, companies that license merchandise from abg directly and and do it wholesale and we we get it from them it's a little bit harder now because everyone around the world has the same designs so there's not much choice out there so we we sort of have to find ways to be you know where we can find different things that maybe aren't as accessible and mj1 is a great example of that you know we do a lot of mj1 stock on the website the mission was always to bring official michael products to people around the world it bothers me that MJ1 is only available in Vegas. Right, um, I know. <laughs> and I've got fan friends in Romania who just said, we're never going to get to see MJ1. And I'm like, well, at the least, you know, the least you could do is, is be have access to what they have available. I'll do it for you. You know, I'll, mm-hmm. next time I go to Vegas, I'll load up the suitcase and bring it back and then walk through customs like you're smuggling a dead goat. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that sort of thing where you're sort of looking left and right. That was always the, the kind of intent behind King of Shop. It was always originally to deliver affordable merchandise. Unfortunately, you know, Certain factors have meant that it can't always be affordable to everybody, but we try where we can to keep the price as low as possible. Yeah, well, I think that's great. I think that you have managed to find an interesting balance kind of working with the estate that a lot of other fan groups have not been able to figure out. So I think it's encouraging to to hear that. I would like to ask one slightly delicate question. Um, And this is looking at the fan community and your own place in it over this, you know, past decade plus, I'd like to discuss how your role and your relationships have changed over time. So, um, for example, before you started running Kingvention, you were involved in some official fan events, such as the Michael Bush exhibition in London, which as a lot of fans will know, did result in controversy around (laughs) fraudulent signatures and costumes. Yeah. And it caused a big stir in the fan community. So at the MJ cast, we really do want to get the truth firsthand. So would you be willing to take us through that experience and kind of talk about how you got caught up in that um, <laughs> and what came out of it? Yes. And let me just say, you know, I really appreciate being given the platform to do so because I think there's been a lot of misconception about what happened there. So, you know, I do, I do appreciate that. Um, so, you know, initially I had when I was doing Iconic magazine and we interviewed Julian's auction a couple of times for the magazine, just sort of stayed in contact with them. And then when the, the Michael Bush thing came up, the exhibition, they were having a launch event. And so we emailed them and said, hey, can we come? And they were like, yeah, sure. You know, there's, there'll be tickets on the door. You can come. So we went down to the launch event and I was just looking at it and thinking, this is incredible. Like they had this huge image of him on the wall. And I thought, this is amazing. And I was just looking up at it. And this woman just tapped me on the shoulder, a lady called Melissa. And she said, uh, do you like that? And I was like, well, obviously. <laughs> and she said, uh, oh, yeah, I organized it. I'm the marketing director for Westfield, which is the shopping center where it was held. So are you a fan then? I was like, yeah, like, obviously. Again, I had like a Michael <laughs> T-shirt on and I was in awe of this picture. So she was like, um, oh, who are you here with? So I said, oh, you know, my husband and my, my friend. And she said, oh, uh, what are you doing in two weeks? It's like, what do you need me to do in two weeks? It's more of a question. (laughs) So she was like, look, you know, this stuff here is going to Japan in two weeks and we're bringing in a whole new lot of stuff. How would you feel about coming in to help set it up? And I was just like, are you kidding? Like, Mm -hmm. yes. You mean I get to to handle Michael's costumes? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. She was like, great. I just need to clear it with Julian's auction and, you know, Michael Bush and make sure they're all right. So I said, well, you know, I met Michael Bush in Ireland when he had the exhibition in Ireland a couple of months back. So he does know like we've met. 
sort of two weeks went by and we turned up for this changeover and we got to take all the costumes off the mannequins that were currently up and then put the new ones out. And that was a really um, emotional experience. You know, they had uh, the Red Lion shirt there that he wore on the last day. And after that event, I emailed the estate and I just sort of said, how can you let this go to auction? You know, this shouldn't, this shouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. So we did the changeover. We sort of set it up and then about a week later, I had an email from Melissa and just, she just sort of said, you know, we're not getting fans through the door. Do you have any, any ideas? Perhaps we could meet for coffee. You work in marketing. So I was like, okay, cool. So I love chatting with other marketers and talking about nothing. <laughs> so we went for coffee and I just sort of said, oh, you know, your price is too high. You, you're charging 10 pounds. It's not fair on the fans to charge 10 pounds. You need to do half price. So they set up a discount code so that fans could get in for half price. I said to them that their book, they had a program. I said that was too expensive and they reduced the price of that. And also I said, you know, you need to give fans more access to the costumes. You won't let them take pictures. You won't let them see them. You've got to bring more costumes out. And so they started to do that. Like we got them to bring out the history jacket, the gold tour jacket and put it on display so that people could have a photo with it and those sort of things. So I tried to help them as much as I could. Michael's name was above the door and I wanted it to do well. And then they said, oh, you, you have a shop, right? So he was like, yeah, they were like, well, maybe you could bring down some merchandise and sell it. That might get people through the door. So I was kind of like, mm, I don't know if this is, this is the right thing for us, but we did it anyway. You know, we, we set up the merchandise and we, we did that. And then they said, Oh, well, Halloween's coming up and we want to run a book launch. Do you want to run it for us? And so <laughs> we were kind of like, yeah, why not? We've done everything else. Mm -hmm. So we set up this book launch and then, you know, as the, time was going on a lot of things happened like they changed the price of the book it was originally 30 then it went up to 40 and the gallery would be open and then it wouldn't there were so many factors involved it just sort of became really chaotic so we did the book launch and somebody in the queue said to me don't you think the signature looks like the ones on the costumes mm -hmm. and the god's honest truth is i'd never really looked at them mm -hmm. in that much detail to to think i just sort of you know, had, had seen it and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, she said, don't, don't you think it looks like the thing? And I said, actually, I said, there is, uh, you know, aside from, from not really looking at the questions, there was one point they had these like photo boards um, in the cabinets that had been signed by Michael Bush. And when we were resetting up the, the exhibition, uh, Darren Julian said, oh, don't put that back out. People might think it's signed by MJ. And I just said, oh, but people have already seen them. And he's like, yeah, don't put those out. Just put them in the back room. So I said, okay, fine. So we put them in the back room. And I remember saying to someone, that was a weird thing to say. You know, they've already been out. So anyway, so yeah, this, this fan said, you know, don't you think it looks like that? And I didn't really think anything of it. And then when the event was over and I was walking around the exhibition, I started to look at the staff and I was thinking, oh my God. You know, it, it suddenly dawned on me what I could have been looking at. Mm-hmm. And this fan then went and wrote a really scathing blog about everything that was going on, you know, the book launch and all this sort of stuff. So I just sort of messaged her online and said, can we meet? I'd really like to talk to you. I'd like to get your perspective. I'd like to tell you my side of it. So we did. We met for coffee. Funnily enough, I keep saying this and I don't drink coffee. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just to add. Um, you know, so we met and we spoke about it. And again, it really started to dawn on me that actually... This, this might not be, you know, this might not be Michael Jackson's autograph. And so I phoned Darren Julian one evening and I just sort of said, look, Darren, you know, I'm feeling really uncomfortable to call you about this, but I'm really concerned that people are raising this notion that these autographs aren't his. And I think I agree with them. We had quite a heated conversation after that, <laughs> um, sure, of course. which didn't go down very well. I came off the phone and I felt really just awful because I was like, I don't know what to do. So we kind of wrote this. Oh, then it, it sort of transpired that it was like people were saying that they were fake costumes. And I was like, well, I haven't heard that side of it. You know, I'm just talking about the autographs. So we sort of wrote this, this statement to say, you know, we've worked with Julian's. They've been really great with us. They let us handle the costumes. They're not fake. We've seen them in real, you know, regarding the autographs. We don't, we don't believe that Michael Bush would do that. Because it was all, it, uh, to, to put it into context, it was all just happening. You know, it was like mm -hmm. every minute it was just happening. And we were trying to find middle ground and fair ground with this and just 
look at it logically. And at the time, I just thought, there's no way he would do that. Surely sure. not. Right. So we, we put this statement out. And it was then shared by, uh, I think, uh, I think Westfield shared it. Julian's auction shared it. Michael Bush shared it as if it was an official statement. And we were like, no, no, no. Like oh, wow. this was just us sharing our feelings. This wasn't any official statement. And, you know, as a result of that, I started to get death threats. So oh, I had goodness. to, so we did call the police, you know, we had uh, some death threats about our involvement with that. And I, the whole thing was just turning into this nightmare. And so the exhibition, we sort of started to pull back from the exhibition a lot uh, and just not really get involved. And then uh, when it ended, they said, oh, you know, we are, uh, Michael Bush has got crates and crates of books that need to be shipped to somewhere in six months. Would we be able to store them with you? So I just sort of said, yeah, that's fine. You know, just bring them around. So these, these books sort of came. And then as the the situation went on with, with the signature scandal and it obviously grew and grew online and we were receiving more hate mail, I just sort of contacted them and said, I want these books out of my house. I don't want these here anymore. I don't want anything to do with this. You made my life an absolute misery. I, I want it gone. So they said, yeah, yeah, okay, we'll come and get them. And they never did. So then I just sort of said, right, okay, fine. Well, if you want me to keep them here, I'm going to charge you storage fee. <laughs> yeah, okay, fine. We'll, we'll pay you a storage fee. So I sort of sent over an invoice and they didn't pay. Right. Uh, a month went by, two months went by and I still had them. Three months went by and I still had them. So I just sort of said, okay, look, I'm going to put them out in the street. So, oh my gosh <laughs> just just for context i lived at the time in east london so anyone that knows <laughs> east london will know if you put something out in the street it's gone in seconds <laughs> so i just sort of said i'm going to put them out in the street because this is unfair now you know i'm getting daily abuse f for you i'm storing your product and you're not you know you're not compensating me so um wow. they just sort of said okay fine look you know michael bush will meet you in london and pay you so I was like, okay, fine. So uh, we went to to meet him in Piccadilly Circus. He came with his brother and Seb and my other friend were talking to him and I just sort of stood in the background for a bit. I didn't want to speak. And he was explaining his situation and saying, you know, I've had it really tough. I've been attacked by people and blah, blah, blah. And then I just lost it. And I just said, I've had death threats because of you. Wow. And he said, well, don't you think I have? And I said, well, Yes, but you got five million from your auction, so I'm sure you can pay for protection. Mm. And so, you know, again, we had a very heated exchange, and that was kind of it. That was the end of, of our association with him. Turns out I then went to Vegas and went to a meet and greet that he was at, and it was a very <laughs> frosty uh, reunion. And, um, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, the situation just snowballed into this nightmare on reflection and you know anybody that's asked me about it and, and wanted to ask me about it I've answered very honestly do I think those autographs are Michael's absolutely not hmm. not a chance mm -hmm. I have expressed that feeling to to people that have asked me the problem is I think people looking from the outside can sometimes make their own conclusions about something and Twitter as a good example can be it's very hard to convey how you feel in 140 characters or right. the situation when you have opportunities like this, like we're having now, you can sort of tell the story at length and explain everything that happened. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you can't do that. And I, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm not the sort of person to go sit on YouTube and make a video. That's just, I don't like the camera. <laughs> um, <laughs> I understand. So, you know, in hindsight, should I have expressed more of what happened? Absolutely. But at the time, it just, it didn't seem like the best solution to, to a fire that was just raging. Yeah, well, it certainly does sound like you were kind of swept away in it all and didn't necessarily have that full perspective or even the time to truly kind of assess what exactly what was going on and, and decide how to deal with it. Um, yeah, with so much else going on around you. Um, how do you feel? I feel like this whole controversy in the last couple years has gotten kind of forgotten a little bit. Um how do you feel about people buying Bush's book and really kind of glorifying him again? Do you have any feelings about fans who really defend him now and for, forget about all this other stuff that happened? I mean, look, I, I, I want to clarify a point. 
recently, as in last year, there was a, an auction where the Cannes Film Festival jacket was sold and it was on display in London. And Michael Bush was at that event. And I went to the event and there is a photo of me talking to Michael Bush and I'm laughing. Mm -hmm. And the gallery that hosted the event put the photo online and then a few fans messaged me <laughs> and was like, you're a traitor, you're a Judas. Mm -hmm. How can right. you laugh and joke with him? Now, the actual context of that conversation was that I'd said to Michael Bush, we have issue between us. <laughs> it's unresolved. But in light of what is happening at the moment, 2019, as we all know, we need to unite against our common enemy. What's that phrase? You know, like the enemy of my enemy is my friend, whatever, you know, <laughs> right. some sort of phrase like that. And I just sort of said, right now, our problem is bigger than all of this. And we need to deal with that. So I said to him, what do you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. And I challenged him on a lot of things. I said, you know, what are the estate doing? You're friends with the estate. You go to their events. What are they doing about this? Are they doing a documentary? Are they doing a rebuttal? What's happened? Did you know those two? Did you engage with their families? How did that go? I was basically probing him for information. Of course, in the context, if somebody makes a comment that's funny, you laugh. And that's the moment that gets photographed. And people go, oh, you were laughing and joking, you know. Right. <laughs> and that, that really wasn't it. And that moment was very much about putting our differences aside to try and understand what's happening. He did say that he's filmed something for the estate in relation to all of this. So, you know, I learned that while being there. But in terms of people glorifying him and, and buying his book, it's difficult. I'm not in a position to tell anyone what they should and shouldn't do. You know, there will be people out there telling fans not to buy my book. There'll be people telling fans not to listen to this cast. You know, right. they're, they're, <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, yeah, right. So, <laughs> It, it, I'm, I don't want to be like, you know, you should do this, you should do that. That's, that's not the way I see things. It is The book is a great book from what I flicked through. I've never actually read it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's put a bad taste in my mouth over it. In terms of people glorifying him, you know, I, I can't speak to that. All I can say is from, from looking at that, do I think that's Michael's autograph? No. If people look at that, it, you know, if people look at that and say, well, I think it is, I can show them Michael's autograph and say, you know, perhaps go to Specsavers. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I can't beat someone into submission and I don't believe that's the way to do stuff. And sadly, sometimes I think that there's been this, there's a way of doing things, isn't there? There's a way of saying to people, have you considered this? Have you looked at this? Maybe you should read this. And there's also saying, if you support this person, you're a horrible person too. And you can don't, and I just don't think that's the right way to do it. I try not to get caught up in that controversy regarding that now. I think the damage has been done. It saddens me that now people will perhaps buy things in the future that aren't Michael's autograph, in my opinion, and kind of redefine what Michael's autograph looks like for future generations. That really makes me sad. I think his autograph was stunning. And it's now been watered down to some horrible loops and swirls and scribbles. That's a really good point, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and, and diverting from the topic a bit, obviously we had yesterday the, the social media post that went up with the image of the impersonator <laughs> on the official Michael Jackson channel. Yes, we and did. <laughs> as an isolated incident, you know, that, that's frustrating. But when you look at it in the context, there will be people that see that, that maybe don't know, that will save that and use it as an image of Michael in the future. And it's diluting the fact that that isn't him. And it, I feel the same about those signatures. You know, it's it kind of it's changing what it's changing history. And I don't I don't like that. Mm -hmm. No, those are all incredibly good points. And thank you, Pez, also for just laying this all on the table. We really do appreciate this. I, I know some of these topics may be sometimes hard to, to talk about, but um, and I'm sorry that you've received so much, you know, personal criticism over the years, but really, really appreciate having your side of it. So thank you for being open about discussing that. No problem. Just as a, a final point on that, you know, I just want to be clear that while sometimes it may not seem that I'm sitting on Twitter shouting about it, it doesn't mean that I haven't gone to the person themselves and raised it. And, you know, that's been the case with many things. When I was in Vegas in 2014, I raised the fake songs with the estate directly. I asked them to their faces about it. The same with Michael Bush about, about the signatures, as I mentioned previously. So, you know, I'm never adverse to airing it with the person it concerns. But I feel that sometimes people want you to kind of stick a flagpole in the ground and say, this is where I stand on it. For me, that's not always the tactic. 
Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought that up. That was actually a question I was about to ask was regarding the Casio tracks. You have been vocal about those online, given your association also like off and on with the estate. Have you seen backlash from them? And and also, what is it like to kind of white, walk this tightrope act of essentially, you know, running more or less official Michael Jackson fan events, running King Vinchin, while also being a vocal critic of the estate? How does that work for you? Well, just to clarify, like nothing we do is officially endorsed by the estate. Um, I get that. Yeah. They've been very vocal of their dislike for some of the things we do, most notably okay. Kingvention. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, I want to hear about that. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I think I've always tried to to have this mentality with the estate that it's, I think, uh, to make Michael's legacy work, we all need to kind of work on the, sing from the same hymn sheet. And if I just sort of stick my walls up and say, everything you do is terrible, I just feel like that's not going to get us anywhere. So I try to sort of say, why are you doing this? This isn't on. And, you know, that's mostly not well received. <laughs> <laughs> There's been some some very, very unkind things that I've heard on the grapevine said about me as a result. But, you know, I think I do believe in in, in taking it to the source. And I, I went to Las Vegas and I saw MJ1 and I met them and I said, you know, about the Casio tracks. In 2012, I went to the Bad 25 premiere uh, in London and I mentioned the Casio tracks to Branca and I said, you know, why did you do that? I can't remember exactly what he said, so I, I don't want to quote him word for word, but it was something along the lines of, well, we had no reason to doubt they weren't him. Hmm, right. You know, and I just right. sort of said, well, my ears told me it wasn't him. So, <laughs> right. you know, uh, and then I said, oh, you must put Slave to the Rhythm on the next album. And that was kind of the end of our conversation. Like I said, uh, sorry, I'm just sort of rolling on a train here. So <laughs> No, please go. It's all very interesting. Go ahead. Yeah, I th- I believed in in taking it to the source i think we then spoke about you know including fly away and toto on bad 25 and why they didn't put other songs on instead that was sort of the the context of the conversation but you know the casio tracks i have my own opinions on why they were there and what they hoped to achieve from that again that's just my opinion i don't that's not come from anywhere that's just something i've come up with that was the moment that really kind of split things in the fan community a lot beyond repair I would like to hear your opinion about why they included the Cassia tracks. Are you willing to share that? Okay, like, so this is total conspiracy theory. This is just <laughs> That's me, okay. Right? <laughs> there is, I just, again, to clarify, there is no, I have no source for this. I have no backing for this whatsoever. This is just what I've come up with. So I personally think, do you remember when there was all those stories after you passed away about, oh, there's 300 songs in the vault. Sure. Mm-hmm. Right? So... If people heard those songs and bought into them, then whoever recorded them could be churning them out for the next 10, 20, 30 years. More and more and more songs. Here's another song. Here's another song. Here's another song. Mm -hmm. And they could, you know, keep that cash cow going for decades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that didn't work out, did it? So because we used our ears and logic and went, hang on a minute. Who's that? So you think that was a test run to uh, try out the supposed endless vault? My opinion is that, yeah. yeah. I mean, again, I have no foundation for that. That's just totally what I think. It's, hey, I think it's a good theory. (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely. Thankfully, we have a fan base who's super educated and calls them out, um, except for a few random people out there who seem to defend the Calcio tracks. But Yeah, I mean, uh... (laughs) when when that first song came out, I remember when Breaking News um, streamed Mm -hmm. on MichaelJackson.com and I got up at 5 a.m. to hear it. And I remember I was like really tired and whatnot. I switched my computer and I put my headphones in and I heard the intro and I was like, okay, we're going upbeat. This is great. You know, we haven't had upbeat for ages. Mm-hmm. And then when that first kind of, eh, 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 I was like, sorry, what is this? <laughs> Who is this singing? Um, and then I had to leave for work at 7am and I phoned my friend on the way to work and I was just raging. I was like, it isn't him. It's not him. And then, so I set up um, an email address, that's not MJ at mjvibe.com. And I put out a call to all the fans online saying, send me your emails and I'm going to take every single one down to Sony. And we did that. You know, we, wow. we weren't allowed through the door, but I had it over the envelope. Me and two other fans set up the Facebook page, Breaking News is not sung by Michael Jackson. You know, we were livid, like rightly so, like all of us were, but um those songs are just, as I say, I think that's just divided the fan community 
forevermore, unfortunately. I wish I had been. So I I was not. I, I'm a lifelong fan. I've been a Michael Jackson fan since I was, you know, three years old going to see Captain EO at Disneyland obsessively. But I was really not part of the organized fan community until a few years ago. So it's been such an interesting process for me and experience for me to really kind of see everything that was going on around, you know, 2009, 2010, yeah. all of those years. You know, I was seeing it from kind of an outsider perspective. So getting your take on what on like jumping in, having those emails, I mean, I think that's that's fantastic and and good to hear. But I do want to just touch on one more estate topic and then I promise we'll move on from this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just in terms of the positives and negatives yeah. and given your perspective from where you are in the community, what do you personally feel they get right and wrong? I mean, we can obviously identify some wrong things, but <laughs> is there stuff that they're doing right? <laughs> um, hmm. uh, wow. You've rendered me speechless for the first time <laughs> in two hours. Um, I think, you know, there are things that I've always tried to judge the estate projects on. If I think they've, they've done something well, then I will buy it and I'll support it. Like, I love MJ1. I think that's great. And I've seen it five times and I go to Vegas every year and I not just for MJ1. I love Vegas and I see the show and I buy everything in the shop and I love that. You know, some of the merchandise I love. Some I think is terrible. There are individual projects that I've really enjoyed. I thought Bad 25 parts of that were great i really enjoyed the box set not so much the dvd the bad and webley dvd wasn't very well put together mm -hmm. but you know there are there are pockets of things i liked escape you know i think they did escape quite well so there are pockets of things that i think they do well you know there are many things <laughs> i think they don't do well you know and just i think one thing i learned is that when michael was alive he always made it clear not to try and control the fan community you know mm -hmm. you let the fans be fans and i remember working for a company that were based in dubai years ago it was a like a voucher book like a buy one get one free with vouchers this facebook group had spawned from it and people would trade vouchers on this facebook group and it had fifty thousand members on it and the company said to me i was a marketing manager for europe at the time and they said we need to control that facebook group we need to own it we need to get mm. on it and i was like no no that's the worst thing you can do let fans be fans because the minute you try to police fans and tell them how to play you change the dynamic. Mm -hmm. And I think the estate's biggest problem is that they've tried to tell the fans how to be fans. Hmm. Michael never did that. He let the fans be fans. You know, you want to create something in my name? Cool. You want to celebrate me with an event? Cool. You want to do a magazine about me? Great. Whereas I feel that the estate have been like, you shouldn't do this and you can't do that and you can't have this and you can't have that and this, that and the other. And it's just, this is, you can't police fans, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. Such a good point. And I even think back to some of our episodes, like um, with Sean Fitzgerald, who was running one of the fan groups back in the in the 80s during, you know, prime, wow. like golden age of Michael Jackson. And yeah, it was like that. They I mean, they really got to kind of do what they want. And they were they had a great working relationship with the estate, like a lot of faxes back and forth back then. Yeah. But yeah, it was just a supportive you know, open relationship. And I, it's really, really a shame that we don't have that. I, I fully agree that it feels like it's very much over controlled. And then the idea that the estate thinks that they know what we want, even though we yell and scream about what we actually want. <laughs> the thing is, I think there is, you know, there is a challenge for them. And I sure. fully understand the challenge that everybody wants different things. And everybody expects, you know, you go on Twitter and they do a post when it's him. And uh, you see the comments underneath that sort of say, give us History 25, give us Dangerous 25, you know, give us unreleased music. And I understand where the estate are coming from on that, where they're like, we can't just push stuff out every year. There's only a limited supply. Mm -hmm. And I understand that, you know, like we have new Freddie Mercury tracks that come out now. And Freddie's been gone for almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. we i want that for michael as well i want to be hopefully i won't be doing as much in 30 years but you know I, I want my nephew and niece again to be able to go and buy the new michael jackson song but if we rinse it all now there'll be nothing left so i understand kind of you know not releasing stuff all the time and i understand that there is a challenge with that but equally there is this kind of fingers in the ears we know best but we're doing it this way and if you don't like it tough type yeah. type attitude that i know i've found 
myself on the receiving end of being a quote unquote problem. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, like I said to you, I will always voice my opinion on those things to the people where it's concerned, please or offend. And it seems more often than not, it tends to have offended and upset. So I can't help that. But I always try to do it in a way that's diplomatic. You know, I never just sort of go at them with stuff. I try to say, you know, why are you doing this when you could have done this or have done this? And it's usually don't tell us how to do our job. So. Right. So have they specifically pushed back with Kingvention, for example? I mean, and for, and I have to say just I because I I go to a lot of writers conferences, I know how like insane it is to put on any kind of conference or convention (laughs) so the fact that that you put on a convention is like um boggles my mind it makes my brain explode but um but yeah so have they given you a made that difficult for you yeah i mean look we every year we do the event we we invite them as a as a means of saying we're not hiding anything from you we're not trying to do something behind your back we're not trying to you know take away your rights or anything like that so come come and see what we do every year obviously they decline but you know there's a uh, whole other side to this story, which really not very nice side, which I won't get into right now. But um, as a result, I ended up having a conversation with the estate. And the first two events, we had uh, an artistic impression of Michael's eyes as our logo. Mm. And they said, um, you need to change that. It's damaging our brand. (laughs) And I just sort of said, well, I can show you what's damaging your brand and it isn't those eyes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And the feedback I had was the estate are happy to turn a blind eye to fan projects, even if they violate our rights. But when it's brought to our attention in this context, then we have to tell you. So Mm -hmm. I said, okay. And I changed it to a crown and I'm happy with the crown. Mm -hmm. Then we had convention last year, 2019, after the event, Larry Stessel, who's uh, one of our special guest that year who is a fantastic guy as well he knows John Branca very well he emailed him and said oh I've just been at convention you guys should really get behind this it's a great event and John replied and said "Uh, yes I hear it's a great event they're good people that run it then somebody else from the estate also replied and said it's not officially endorsed by us we don't you know we don't back it it's they do their own thing and you know, the usual kind of rhetoric. So, you know, they've not been actively outspoken about their discontent for it, but they don't endorse it either. Well, I am glad at least that you've been able to carry on with it. And I really hope to get there in person one day. I would love We'd to We'd love that. to have you. Yeah. I should say too, if you ever come to, next time you come to Vegas, I'm only a few hours drive away. So you have to let me know. Yes, definitely. <laughs> now, Pez, we're going to take a quick break here. Here at the MJ Cast, we feel so grateful every single day to have such an awesome, dedicated listener base who shares our episodes and asks how they can help support the show. One really simple and very fun way to help support our show running costs is by going to the mjcast.com slash shop. This will link you to our Redbubble storefront, where you will see five great designs, all created as originals by Jamin, who is very talented. And you can place these designs, such as our podcast logo or the Captain EO characters, on any product you want. And they have all kinds of stuff. They have all different styles of t-shirts. I have a bunch of those. They have hoodies, mugs, travel mugs for coffee, phone cases, prints and artworks, tote bags, which I particularly like. They're pretty large and great for groceries. And they also have things like little stickers that are only about $1.50 or $2 each, as well as face masks, which are great right now during COVID. Redbubble has excellent customer service, and we support all of the products they make. It's a great, great way to help show your support of the podcast and also of Michael Jackson. We're all one MJ fam after all, right? All proceeds from our shop sales go to show running costs, charity donations, and equipment so that we can continue to make a better and better show for you. Help promote the MJ cast and Michael Jackson all at the same time with a purchase from the mjcast.com slash shop. And be sure to share your pics with us on social media. We love, love, love seeing you wearing our merch. And we love to share that with our social media community. Thanks again. 
So again, Pez, thanks for being so open about all of this stuff. It's really amazing to hear these stories firsthand and to understand your experience over this past decade. So I do want to ask just a few other questions. So first of all, you have been a vocal advocate for Michael since the release of Leaving Neverland last year. For the record, and even though we see you tweeting about this, can you let us know how you feel about the past and present allegations and really most importantly, how that has been handled in the media and by the fan community? And also, lastly, whether you have suffered any personal repercussions in your vocal defense of Michael? Wow, yes, is uh, so the answer to, to that last question in particular. But I mean, you know, we all knew what was going on with, with the, the court case from 2013. And when this thing just came out and they said, oh, we're going to, this film's coming out. Seb and I, you know, we have these long talks about Michael and about the community and stuff. And he was like, I'm really worried. And I just sort of said, look, I've always said this until they stop playing his music and they start taking statues of him down. Don't worry about it. We've been through this before. We've ridden this storm. It'll be fine. Famous last words, (laughs) you know, because then they stopped playing the music and the statues started coming down and I was sort of really eating my hat. I think last year was such a... It was just a horrible year for everybody. I mentioned earlier in the, in the cast that I had a personal issue that I was dealing with last year. My mum was diagnosed with cancer at the beginning of the year. Um, oh, sorry. Last year. Thankfully, she's in remission now. But it was a really, you know, a really challenging situation to deal with. So when Leaving Neverland came up, it was just kind of like, not today, Satan, this isn't happening. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I was like, you know, taking out my frustrations on people that were just idiots. And I found found it therapeutic in that sense. But, you know, it's just we're, we're back at this point again where logic seems to go out the window in favor of just kicking Michael down. And when you explain to people, like when you go to the pub or remember that before lockdown, when you go to the <laughs> pub or anything like that, and you, you talk to people about it and you explain it to them. They're like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Or when they watch Square One and say, oh, I, I didn't know that. You're like, this is what I've been saying. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the point. And I think, you know, from, from doing all the things I've done and I stay in contact with every collaborator of Michael's that I've interviewed or spoke with or had at convention, I stay in contact with all of them all the time. And all of them have been like, you know, this is ridiculous. This is the, the most ridiculous thing. Jonathan Morris, who was Michael's communications person for Sony for 25 years, Again, as with Dan Beck, they were kind of like yin and yang. I adore Jonathan with with all my heart. He is such a wonderful person. And we went for dinner after leaving Neverland and he was just outraged. And he was like, how can they do this to Michael again? Like, we have to do something. We have to we have to set the record straight. We have to do something. And I just said to him, look, let me know what you need me to do. Tell me when and where and I'll be there. You know, we, we've spoken about maybe things that we could look at and ways that we could explore doing stuff to try and, you know, reset the balance in, in our own way in ways that we can. But it's just, you know, I think this is insane, this whole situation. I just if I look back at what happened when the film came out and everything that, that sort of happened after you think, how has this happened again? And how are people believing this? This is this is the most ludicrous of all the claims that have ever come out about Michael. Michael's been accused of fathering more children than he has been accused <laughs> of abusing children. Right. But nobody wants to believe those claims right. of, of paternity. Yeah, and when, when you look at everything in context and you just dissect it, it's just insane. For the life of me, I can't understand how people are so willing and so happy to just gobble this nonsense up. And you mentioned you have actually had repercussions in your personal life in being a vocal supporter of, of Michael. There are some people that I'm friends with and had messaged me afterwards and said, you know, I believe it. I've seen it and I believe it. So I said, well, are you happy for me to tell you why it's wrong? And they said, yeah, okay. So I went, you know, did a full breakdown of of the film and, and why it's wrong. And they said, yeah, I see what you're saying, but I still believe it. And so I said, okay, well, that's it for us then. We're done. Mm. And people are always surprised with that. They're like, you're not going to throw our friendship away over this, are you? (laughs) <laughs> and I was, you know, my answer to that is simple. You believe that the person I idolized did something so heinous and horrific. How could you think that of me? 
How could you right. be okay with me? How could you have me at a dinner party and be like, this is Pez. He's a Michael Jackson fan. When you think that I'm okay with the idea that that happened, mm -hmm. we can't be friends. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it's a sacrifice you have to make. You know, you have to say, well, if, if you're going to continue to believe it after I've explained it to you and you think that I would be okay with that, then no, you know, we, we're done. And, you know, that, that was for some, that was really hard, you know, that's, but I am a hundred percent behind Michael in this. So if you need to leave, you need to leave, you know, L let me show you the door and then slam it behind you. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's the thing that's amazing to me too, is, um, that all these people think that Michael Jackson fans are just complete apologists and putting him up on a pedestal. And that's what I say as well. I, you know, I tell people if, Yes, I, I do a podcast. It's a huge part of my life. If I ever had reason, some proof to truly believe any of this happened, I would walk away in a second. Exactly. Um, exactly. And it's just baffling to me. They think I wouldn't do that. <laughs> and, and that's the thing, isn't it? You know, we when these allegations come out, each time we as fans have to sit back and say, what is this? Let me look into this. You know, have I backed the wrong horse here? Do I need to do I need to reassess what I thought I knew? And so we look and we dig and we read and we study and we analyze. So when we do all of that and we come to the conclusion, which we knew at the beginning, was that Michael is 100% innocent, don't write me off as an apologist or a truther mm -hmm. because I've done more background research and more you know, study to know what I'm talking about. Too many people are willing to just lead with their heart and I have this real issue with this concept of, believe all victims right. you know well, well let's look at the language of that you know as somebody that's just written a book let's look at language so firstly the term victim there are no conclusive victims in this situation except michael in my opinion if i say at least stole my wallet <laughs> am i automatically a victim of theft or am i accusing you of stealing my wallet right so I don't like the term victim that's automatically assigned to someone without, you know, due process. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the term belief. Belief is not the right word. The word should be listen. We should listen to people. If somebody comes out and says something, absolutely we should listen. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, even if it's about Michael, we need to listen. You know, you, if someone says something, you have to listen and hear what they're saying. After you've heard them, you can then determine it's absolute nonsense, <laughs> which is what we have done. Mm -hmm. But it's about listening. It's not about belief because belief is where it gets dangerous. Several years ago, somebody committed fraud in my name. It wasn't like a bad fraud, but it was still a fraud. It was somebody close to me and I ended up in court because this fraud had been committed in my name and they thought I'd done it. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter what I said. No one in the courtroom would believe me. Mm -hmm. Wow, and that's I, when terrible. I, when <laughs> I tried to speak, the, the, <laughs> that's okay. When I tried to speak, the judge said, no, I'm speaking. And I'm just literally standing in this dock in my suit thinking, like, no one believes me. I went away. I, they said, oh, we're going to move it to a higher court. You know, I didn't even get the chance to speak. And they decided to move it to a higher court. And I went away and I produced all my evidence to show where I was. You know, I had witness statements. I had uh, character witness statements. I had bank statements to prove where I was at the time that I couldn't have been there. So I went to the... Um, you know, I went to the court with all this evidence and it was thrown out in a heartbeat. And I came out of that courtroom and I burst into tears because not because I'd been vindicated, but because nobody believed me in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and nobody let me have my say. You know, thankfully, the person that did it owned up to doing it, which also helped in the end. Oh, wow. Wow. You know, having that on that minute scale and understanding what that feels like. Now imagine it on Michael's scale. And so that's right. why I will exactly. always listen, research, analyze, and then place my belief. I won't, I will never just say, I believe outright, because I think that's the wrong way to approach stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, those are good lessons for all of us, <laughs> I think, truly. I can't, and I just cannot believe what you went through. Oh, my goodness. Um, 
Well, that is fantastic. Thank you so much. So I just have one last question on the topic of the fan community. And then I just have a few little fun things. So, you know, you're a your longtime content creator within the Michael Jackson worldwide fan community. And you and all of us at the MJ cast, as well as any other content creators are very aware of the divisions among the different fan groups. I would love to kind of get your impression of whether is it, you know, kind of the same old arguments we've been having for years and years and years, or have they evolved over time? And do you personally at this moment in time, see any solutions for how we might eventually come together as a community? Um, wow. My first order is to solve world peace. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm giving you the big ones here. <laughs> you really have. Um, I feel like I'm at a pageant. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's it's difficult, isn't it? it? It's it's one of those things where we are all in the same situation because we love and respect Michael, but we're never all going to get along. And you see that in every walk of life. It's like you know when you're when you're in the office with people. Thankfully, I'm in a company where I get on with everybody, which is which is great and also rare. But you know you kind of look around sometimes at companies and you see that people are like, you know, we're all here because we have to do a job, but it doesn't mean we're going to be friends or agree on everything. And I find that obviously with Michael that naturally we're not all going to agree on everything. I mean, some people think he's still alive, which is just insane to me, but oh gosh, that's a whole different thing. on its own. <laughs> Right. You know, and like oh, he's leaving clues in album covers. It's like, sure, Jan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it, is, it is challenging because, I, you know, I see stuff all the time and I write the tweet response and then I'm like, no, don't post it because you're going to fall down this rabbit hole and you're going to spend your whole evening on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I've learned over the last 10 years to pick and choose my battles and to pick and choose what I involve myself in. You know, that doesn't mean that it doesn't weigh on my mind, but, you know, I try to try to sort of leave things if I just can see it's not going down the right path. How could we solve it? The honest answer is, uh, I don't know. I think you know, we try, like, for example, with, with things like convention, we try to make an event that everybody can enjoy that doesn't come without its challenges. And sometimes it's, you know, makes people unhappy in certain areas. But we try to do things that can bring people together. And that's what I always want to happen. I want fans to come together. I think it will always be a challenge because, like I said earlier, you know, you've got so many different factions, uh, people that, like, don't like the estate, people that do like the estate, people that like the estate, but don't like that, people that don't like the estate, but do like that, people that are against this is it, but will wear AEG licensed t-shirts from this is it, you know, and it, there's just so many kind of things that it's so many factions that almost it's impossible to bring everybody together. Mm -hmm. I think maybe what's been lost in, in the heart of it is why we all came into it in the first place. It's hard sometimes, but I constantly try to sit back with all the projects going on, take a step back and say, you know, why am I doing this? Why did I come into the fan community in the first place? What is it about Michael that I love? And I rediscover stuff and, and learn stuff all the time. Doing the book was a great insight into learning new things or new ways to see stuff. Mm -hmm. But I really think it, sometimes we need to take a step back and just say, OK, let me take a breather or, you know, take a step back and say, mm, is that the right thing to tweet or am I just trolling? And we've all been guilty of it. You know, I can't say that I haven't been guilty of it in the past. Oh, sure. Uh, <laughs> Twitter like, just just inspires that, I think. Oh, you know, sometimes I wish I could just delete my Twitter and be done. But there's so many great people on there that it would be a shame to sort of shut them off. But mm -hmm. it is a challenge to, to kind of get over that. I think I try more and more now to just, when it comes to fans, to let fans do their thing. If people want to buy stuff from the estate, okay, cool, go do that. You know, if you don't want to buy something from the estate, that's fine too. I think the, the dangerous territory we get into is when we start to lecture each other about how we should behave. Mm -hmm. As long as it's doing nothing that brings the fan community into disrepute as a whole. Like, for example, we did the, um, we was at the Channel 4 demonstration outside Channel 4 um, for Leaving Neverland. Mm -hmm. And the, the organizers specifically requested that people don't come dressed as Michael, and some people did. And I thought that was wrong. You know, mm -hmm. this is about a serious issue. We don't need people turning up in full makeup and a wig to be in front of the TV cameras. That's not what this is about. Right. So there are situations like that where it's kind of like, you know, you can politely say to someone, you shouldn't do that. But as far as what people spend their own money on, I, I think it's hard to sort of say, why are you doing that? Like, you know, I, I bought the Hugo Boss suit when it came out. 
<laughs> did um, you? Yeah, I went to in the rain to because uh, it was like summer, but it was raining in London. And I, I went and bought the suit and I they made a big fuss of me. They were like, you're the first person in, in the UK to own this suit. And <laughs> I was really excited and I tried it on and they were like, now walk up and down. And I was like, no chance. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I and I wore that. I wore the top half of that suit to an event in Paris and people were like, I love your jacket. I'm like, well, did you know it's Michael Jackson branded? <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I loved buying that. And obviously there were people that would be like, you shouldn't have bought that suit. And I'm like, well. You know, I liked it and I'm comfortable with it. So I might sleep in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think, you know, it's 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 difficult because I'd love to bring everybody together and I'd love everybody to sing from the same hymn sheet. But I don't think that's possible. I just hope that the work that I do doesn't upset people. You know, that's that's when I it gets hard when when it becomes personal. And I'm sure, you know, you guys at the MJ cast can relate to that as well when it then becomes personal to, to the work you do. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, the best thing we can do is keep putting out serious content into the world like your book and just try to, you know, create a legacy and put good info out there and come together in the moments when we can and not try to argue too badly when we <laughs> when right. we can't. Um, and I, I do think yeah. just sorry, one more point. That's I okay. think that um, what we're seeing this year in particular is um, a resurgence of the fan community and the content creators and all the things that fans do to uphold Michael's legacy. I think there's a real turning point where people are just kind of like to hell with what's coming officially. Mm -hmm. We'll just do our own thing. Yeah, that's true. You know, and I think that's great. I think that really is because we as the fans will continue to uphold his legacy long after estates change hands and record companies change hands and different people come in and different people go out. We will be the lasting people. Um, and there's been so many wonderful things. You know, there's so many new books coming out this year, which are really exciting. I can't sing Danny Wu's praises enough for mm-hmm. what he did with Square One. So I think we're, we're seeing a real resurgence of like fan power. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I think you're right. And I also think the next generation we're starting to see come in too with their YouTube videos and figuring out on their own how they want to be fans, which I think is exciting. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Great. Um, well, I just have a few fun rapid fire questions for you, if I may. Um, this is nothing darker <laughs> <laughs> or tea based. Um, so, yeah, just a few a few fun questions. Um, so first of all, and we'll just just tell me your answer and just a quick little little explanation of why your favorite MJ song. Oh, no, no. Why are you doing this? OK, um, it's going to take you half an hour. to. <laughs> OK, fine. Uh, can I say, uh, OK, it's between Remember the Time and Blood on the Dance Floor. Oh, OK. Unusual choices. Uh, can you give me a quick reason? Yeah, because Blood on the Dance Floor, st- it starts amazing, it ends amazing and everything in between is amazing. And if <laughs> if ever I'm abducted and the person says they don't like Blood on the Dance Floor, it's not me. OK, I've been like <laughs> someone's come back as me just in case anyone knows and remember the time just because everything from the song to the video to the lyrics to the costume I love it all hmm. great great and then favorite MJ short film and why I'm guessing you're gonna say remember the time or is it something else? I am gonna say remember the time um, <laughs> you know I debate with my friends all the time between smooth criminal and remember the time but for me I love remember the time because obviously it was the first video of its sort to include an entire black cast Michael was the first mm-hmm. person that was like hang on Egypt and I love watching Remember the Time and seeing like the trees in the background waving in the wind. Like that's the attention to detail that Michael Jackson had that mm-hmm. other people don't. So I love that's why I love that video. Absolutely. Yeah. Short film. Um, what, so. a, what was that? <laughs> I said short film, not video. Oh, Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I always have to be careful with that. Favorite MJ performance? Oh, we debate this all the time. I have a game with my friends that we play called Jackson Reaction, where <laughs> you make a statement about what's your favorite or most controversial thing. And if people disagree, they have to drink. <laughs> so I'm going to say, I'm going to be cheap and say MTV 95, just because it's got a bit of everything in there. So you can just chuck it all in. Yeah. And what about favorite Michael Jackson tour? Uh, dangerous tour, hands down. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. Cool. So, and I guess last of all, we have a question we like to ask all of our special guests, and that is, Pez, how should Michael be remembered? Michael should be remembered as a person that you continually 
need to discover. Michael is not uh, just a, you kind of look at him and you get what you see. You, you know, Michael needs to be remembered as a, as a creator, as an innovator, as an artist, as an entrepreneur, as somebody that you can never learn enough. I listen to a Michael song today and I hear things that I never heard before. That's who he was. That's his genius. And I think that's how he needs to be remembered. But also as a person who was innocent. So just throw that one out there as well. I love that. That's perfect. Thank you. That's great. So Pez, again, thank you. This has been really amazing discussion. I've learned a lot. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you again for this book you've done. Can you please let our listeners know where they can find you on various platforms online? So I am on Instagram, not that I post very much interesting stuff, um, at Pez Jacks. And the same on Twitter. If you like someone sounding off, then there's me at, at Pez Jacks on Twitter as well. <laughs> So yeah, that's that's where I can be found. Great. And then also, of course, the 1611 website where you can find the books. And that is 16 spelled out and then the number 11, correct? Yeah. So Dot both com. the English and the French version are available there. And if we get any other translations, hopefully they'll be there too. Absolutely. Well, I hope you do. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for this great discussion. I hope you've liked it as much as I have. Remember that you can rate, review, and subscribe to the MJ Cast on any podcast app, such as Apple Podcasts or Podcast Republic, if you're on Android. And you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram under the MJ Cast, as well as YouTube also. We'll be back soon with a new episode. And in the meantime, stay bad. <laughs>